delay. Uh, it is the continuation of the special meeting on June 7, 2021 of the Enfield Town Council. Um, we already had roll call, so I think we can move right, move right up into the special meeting. We welcome our partners from the Department of Transportation. We're here to discuss um, the rails and trails. And, I'm uh, joining again, the meeting. I'm sorry? With roll call, I'm joining the meeting. Yeah, we don't have to take roll call because we took it downstairs. I know, but I just joined. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so welcome all our partners from DOT. Again, uh, Town of Enfield welcomes you. We're looking forward to a, a nice, robust conversation. And I will turn over to our town manager, uh, Christopher Bromson. Again, welcome, everyone. My name is Mike Ludwick. I'm the mayor. And we uh, look forward to our discussion tonight. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, we have Deputy Commissioner Garrett Ucolito, who I've had the pleasure to speak with and uh, text uh, back and forth with a little bit. And some of our friends, I see Robert Andruski is on and John Burnick, and there are uh, good partners on the uh, rail station we're working towards in Thompsonville. So it's good to see the gang back together again. Um, one day, one of these days soon, Garrett, we'll all be together in person. But it's nice to have this technology. So I know you folks are very busy, so it's nice that you're able to zoom in from you know, the comfort of your home and uh, still accommodate us and our citizens. Uh, by way of background, I will just share with the council, we've had a great deal of interest in this subject. It's the rail to, to trail and also the freight line on the other part of town across from um, where we want to have our new uh, rail station. I just think it's fascinating. If you'd gone back a few years, who would have thought there'd be so much discussion and uh, renewal of rail in Enfield and in Connecticut and in the nation. It's really quite remarkable. He's now joining. Um, so I think it's a good thing on so many different levels. Uh, this is going to be a good uh, discussion. We've had a lot of interest. We had an open enrollment, if you will, a period where a lot of questions came from the council and citizens that we forwarded on to Garrett. Um, and also I've, I've told them previously, Garrett, that due to the volume and complexity of the questions, they wouldn't be answered this evening, that DOT staff would get to them in order and get back to us at a later date. But it gave Garrett and his team the flavor of the conversation of what we're interested in. So I don't want to take up any more time with that. I'll turn it over to DOT for their presentation and then for uh, you know some follow-up questions by the council on the subject. So welcome everybody and the floor is yours, Garrett. Thank you and thank you for having us. Uh, appreciate the interest in this topic. So my name is Garrett Ucolito. I'm the Deputy Commissioner at the Connecticut Department of Transportation, joined by a whole host of our team members who work in the rails uh, uh, office of the Bureau of Public Transportation. So we have um, uh, Rich Andreski, who's the Bureau Chief for Public Transportation. Um, we also have John Burnick, who leads our capital program for rails. Yuri Kulgis, who leads the uh, operations side of rails. Julie Thomas, who is the wizard of all things uh, leases for our team at the DOT Rails Office and Agreements. And we also have Steve Curley, who's in charge of all safety issues for rail in Connecticut. Um, so what we do, we, what we're planning to do is just go through a really brief presentation, then uh, which will address some of those questions that raised. And you can question and answer with the council, if that's okay with you. Is now exiting. Sounds great, appreciate it. Okay, Yuri, right. if you can go to the next slide. So the topics we're going to cover today, um, introductions, and then we'll have a, a discussion from John Burnick to explain what the current existing system is, uh, the operations and the infrastructure. Um, Julie will walk through the process for requesting uh, state property for trail use and talk about what those next steps would be and then open up for questions. Um, so uh, really briefly for introductions, then I'll turn over to Rich Andreski. I know this is a, an issue that lots of communities uh, focus on is how we can utilize um, a freight line that's running through our community. And, um, you know, there are lots of different levels um, involved in this discussion. It's not just a state issue. Um, if you think back to the founding of our country, um, there's different layers of infrastructure as they exist. And uh, waterways are the most um, protected and uh, uh, grandfathered form of transportation in our country. Um, to try and build a bridge over a waterway or that you can't uh, navigate through is gonna have to take an act of Congress um, to change that. Then the next oldest level is a railroad. Um, they came before the roads did. Um, and so they have uh, grandfather rights over our roadways. And then lastly came the highways and the roadways. So 
Um, it's difficult to think about uh, rails existing before our roads, but they did in many instances. And that's why there's a federal program or federal body called the Surface Transportation Board, which exists to oversee all things um, freight rail and rail um, uh, infrastructure. So um, John and Julie will talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but I'll turn it over to Rich to talk about, uh, to give introductions as well. Thank you, Garrett. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. I'm not, I'm, my remarks are going to be brief. I just wanted to let you know that uh, the folks you have here on this uh, Microsoft Teams meeting are are the key people at DOT that have a role in uh, overseeing the operation management and development of our freight rail system. So uh, this team um, is is the the team of folks that will need to provide any technical feedback. Um, there is a deliberate approach that needs to be taken here. Uh, Garrett mentioned the Surface Transportation Board. Uh, even limited freight rail service, which we'll hear about on this line, even if that is very limited in nature and scope, um, it is protected as interstate commerce. Um, so um, <clears throat> there is a, a, a rigorous process or, or that needs to be followed to consider alternative uses of a rail corridor. Um, so you'll hear you'll hear about that. Uh, we're open to answering any questions following the presentation. Uh, but uh, I'm going to hand it off to Yuri Kuljis. Yuri, you want to kick off the presentation? Yes. Good evening, everyone. So the first part, as Garrett mentioned, we'll be talking about the existing system operations and infrastructure. So John Burney, are you on? So we'll be covering that first part. Thank you. Yep, I'm here. Um, Hi, um, so just uh, very briefly, you touched the points on the slide here. Um, the, the rail line, we, we, it's, it's commonly known as the, as the East Longmeadow Secondary. Uh, uh, Central New England Railroad is the operator uh, across that territory. Um, for most of the minor uh, maintenance, uh, including the majority of the track work, uh, we, re we rely on the freight operators to accomplish that, and that's the terms of, of the lease that we have with them. Um, we do inspect the bridges. The bridges are inspected um, visually yearly and they, they have load ratings done on them every three years. Um, uh, and uh, any major maintenance uh, that would be beyond, be beyond the capability of, of the freight operator to handle uh, would fall upon uh, Connecticut DOT as part of our, and we would fit that into our capital program. Um, uh, uh, based on priority. Um, a good example is uh, we recently replaced four bridges on the Housatonic line. Uh, we have a number of bridges that we're doing uh, in Waterbury that's on freight only territory in Pan, in, in Pan Am territory. Um, so uh, as I said, the maintenance of way work, the carriers are generally responsible for maintaining the track structure, the grade crossing, and any minor bridge repairs. When we do the bridge inspections, they generally uh, uh, generate uh, some discrepancies um, we issue those as uh, what we call uh, maintenance repair man uh, memorandums, and um, and and then the uh, and then we monitor uh, that the the freight operator actually goes out there and accomplishes them. Um, and once again, if if our inspection um, identifies a structure that is uh, in in serious condition, um, we we look to prioritize that um, on our five year capital program, and we, and we generally have a. A, a good lead time on that uh, since we're inspecting uh, yearly. The yearly inspections are part of an FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, uh, mandated and approved bridge maintenance program. And that's true not only of the freight territory, but of, of the passenger territory too. So uh, these bridges are inspected uh, the same as we would inspect uh, on our on our on-system uh, passenger system, the, the New Haven Main Line and others. So, John, one thing I, I know questions came in about, um, you know, how much uh, we subsidize the operation of these freight rail uh, systems. So can you talk a little bit about um, how much funding uh, we pay or how much state funding goes into the freight lines for either operations or capital? Just to clarify that uh, uh, question. Uh, on the operation side, um, I, I I defer to uh, uh, Yuri and Julie on that, but on the capital side, 
Um, unless there's something that shows up on our five-year capital program, they're not subsidized. Um, what we do, we do support them in providing them uh, scrap uh, materials that come off the main line. Generally, uh, the main line rail um, that we use on, on, on the passenger service, the New Haven main line, is, is fairly heavy uh, rail. And so once it wears um, to the point where we don't want to use it for high speed passenger traffic anymore, it's, it's still very suitable um, for lower speed freight traffic. Um, and so there's a, a Connecticut statute uh, that mandates that we offer that material to the freight companies. And so we do provide that to them um, and, and they take it and, and use it. Uh, but they, they do all the labor for, for most of the, for the vast majority of the work. Um, uh, unless, like I say, there's a, a bridge replacement or major bridge rehabilitation required, in which case uh, Connecticut DOT as the owner takes that and, and we do that project with uh, generally uh, it's state funding. Yep. Thanks. And Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, our agreements don't provide a subsidy for operations. Um, in fact, it's the inverse where the um, operator will provide the DOT with a portion of their uh, revenues from the operation. That's correct. It's uh, 2% uh, revenues uh, uh, deposited in funds, and then that is used for projects. Thanks. Uh, so the next topic to cover is specifically how to do a rails to trail conversion, um, and part of that would be um, a request coming in to use state property for that trail use. So Julie is going to walk us through that. With that request, that we should have a, just a general design, not requiring a full blown engineer design, but a design that we should be getting Excuse me, but Paul, perhaps you should let Julie know that she's not really coming through. I don't know. Is it her end, our end? Can we re? connect her it's just that it's garbled i don't think anybody can hear what she's saying at least i can't you me, uh, can, I, can you hear me now yeah if you can move a, maybe a little closer to the mic source oh, i'll give it another shot hopefully you can hear me um if not we'll, we'll try it another way uh That's as cool. I, I think we can hear you now julie thank you okay as i was stating the first step is a committal uh, to the department, the rail administrator, Richie Jankovich, from the municipality requesting use of state railroad right away for trail purpose. And included in that should be just a very basic conceptual trail design. Um, that would include just the preliminary layout uh, and the points of any access to the railroad right away. Um, the East Windsor Secondary Line starts at Story Road in South Windsor and extends all the way to the Connecticut Mass Line. So in that preliminary layout, we would expect to see uh, at least the streets uh, where the beginning and end points are of the trail. And then step two would be we would reach out to the point of contact at the municipality and start information sharing. The first step really is you're going to need the state's railroad valuation mapping, which are the old surveys that show the um, width of the rail corridor all the way along the line. It's not going to show topography. It, it will show grade crossings and it will show some historic lights that above the path. But it is just it, it's an old historic uh, valuation map and you, the town would have to have an engineer verify information on that mapping and locate the railroad crossings, turnouts, yards, uh, there is probably uh, that might uh, prove to be an impediment 
to a uh, trail and any sight line impediment should be on that next step. We're going to look at safety considerations. Um, we have a member from our rail regulatory here, Steve Coley, who's probably going to get into a little bit of that later with some of the carcinogen. But uh, for various locations along the route, we might need protective barriers, various safety improvements, especially if there are at grade pedestrian crossings. Uh, we're going to look at existing operations on the line and any potential to fixing and future operations. That's going to be based on, on the current climate uh, and um, magnitude of uh, train movements on the line and also any potential interest in the line. Uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, the legal and the, um, uh, what I mean by legal is, I mean, the real estate interest that exists there. Currently, um, you know, abutters have rights along the line. Uh, those have to be researched in the land records. Uh, we would expect the town to provide a title search and the data to the department of something that the department doesn't have available to us at this point in time. So the municipality would have to provide that. Um, we would uh, offer uh, all of the information we have concerning existing utility agreements along the line and share that with the municipality or its consultant and our any, any uh, plans for future uh, license requests. Right now, there's one for a solar farm that's well into progress that may, may be impacted from a potential trail. Um, and then we have uh, agreements with Comcast and other sports along the line as well. So uh, we could provide that information. Other considerations, which we mentioned before, or are the service sanctification board considerations. Um, the Surface Transportation Board has jurisdictions, of, as we indicated, over all freight rail uh, practice, service issues, rail structure and transactions, line sales, line construction, and line abandonment. It's going to be design dependent upon whether or not uh, what filings would need to be made to the Surface Transportation Board, whether it's going to be a dual use, uh, a request for uh, public use, such as for a trail exemption, et cetera. But all that is going to be design dependent. Um, it's impossible to know right now what types of STD filings would need to be contemplated until we have a design from the municipality. Um, step three, uh, now once, you, once you've been working with us and we've shared information, you're going to go into full-blown design development. Typically, municipalities will hire a consultant um, and then we would be working with you step by step for the design approval process. Uh, we would submit a design, our engineers would review it. We would provide the interim permitting agreements that the municipality which consult we would need in order to do preliminary engineering activities such as survey, uh, any kind of drawing work, any environmental uh, study work, that sort of thing. And then my unit would work with you to develop the actual We lost your sound again. Are you there? There we go. A little better. I don't <clears throat> Again, my office was working with you with many municipalities, four trails, Farmington and Canton. We're working with Watertown and Thomaston right now on a study for a trail on, an, on a rail bank line up there. So we would be more than happy to work with you once you get to that point in the process. Uh, if we determine that um, a trail is feasible within the building. Thanks, Julie. Um, Yuri, can you go to the next slide? Um, so, Julie, did you want to, you talked about the first step. Right. Um, you want to talk about the second one? Sure. Or, okay. The department, um, in light of uh, existing activities, changes in rail infrastructure statewide, is in the process of hiring a consultant 
to review the current level of operation on these new secondary line, the econ its economic benefits, advantages, disadvantages um, for freight service in the region. So that is a step the department is taking um, to do a full assessment of the line in conjunction with uh, your request for a um, Thanks, Julie. That concludes the, the presentation. So we wanted to um, save most time for question and answer with the town council. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we will open up the questions. Um, Councilor Mangini goes first. Thank you uh, for the presentation and for the additional information. Uh, going to the trail uh, question, I see you did identify safety, the protective barriers, which I was very happy to see that addressed. Um, step three, uh, trail design development, I suspect at some point we'll be looking at uh, parking for uh, people that are choosing, you know, to use the trails. And again, I, I know this is early on, but I think um, at some point parking is going to have to be uh, you know, addressed for people that want to participate. So I just want to make sure at some point, um, as we get further into this, you'll have the parking issue looked at. I don't know if the question for Commissioner, I mean, we have, I don't know if we've gotten to the part of design even coming close, we have to, we haven't come close to the design part at this point, so, all right. So that have to be, it'd have to be taken into consideration, certainly. Yep. Okay, thank yep. you. Uh, Councilor Riley, then Councilor Schwabe. Um, So going back to step one um, is what the town submits to the DOT. So are we like in that phase right now because we're having this meeting or do we have to like have like a formal ask? So, uh, Julie can talk, uh, re, uh, re go over step one, but like step one would be an actual submittal that's uh, the actual preliminary layout and points of pedestrian access. So, it there needs to be more work done by the town to submit that to us. Okay. Okay. Councilor Schraz and then Councilor Sakala. Thank you, Mr. Eucalito, for being here uh, tonight. I just have a couple of questions. Number one, uh, about a month ago, I asked our economic development director if she felt the ability to provide a rail service uh, for a business could be a significant economic impact for the town to the positive by growing our grand list. And she said it would be huge. Um, I would like to know if you concur uh, with that statement. So, uh, you know, as the Department of Transportation, we obviously um, work with all forms of rail, both passenger and freight. We're working to develop and hopefully deliver a uh, passenger rail system for Enfield and Thompsonville, but freight rail is very important in our uh, intermodal system. The opportunity to use freight rail uh, means fewer trucks on our interstate highway system and our secondary roads. So it is critically important. And there are certain types of uses that are much more conducive um, to freight rail than for trucking. Um, so, uh, you know, freight rail has significant importance. Um, it is uh, one of the backbones along with our trucking industry that keeps us moving. Um, I think there's always a, a trade-off though. We've seen other communities um, where trails have been a big economic driver if you go to the Farmington Canal Heritage Trail um, and you stop in some of those communities that have a trail, um, the little village centers that popped up with some small businesses around those trailheads are pretty busy in the summer months. So, uh, but freight rail is critical to um, our nation's economic activity. Thank you. Uh, my second question is, um, there was a lot of speculation, a lot of discussion about this project a few months ago. We didn't have the information. One of the concerns was that we'd be having to deal with this freight train going through town, nobody knew, two times, three times, four times a day. Uh, since then, the information I have that the actual user right now is planning one train, not a day, per week. 
So that's a lot different than two or three a day. Um, we have one user, I think, so far that's trying to promote a green energy project with a biofuel, uh, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Down the road, if there were other users, and I understand there are other businesses that want to sign on, um, I'm sure DLT, or you can answer that for me, would have regulatory authority over any future uses in terms of what's being transported, how many times, and all that type of thing. Am I correct in that? Yeah, yeah. Garrett, would you like me to? Sure, sure. Rich, okay. So, so Rich, Rich Andreski here. here. Um, so, so the activity that takes place on the line, the, the, the freight company that operates, whether it be the current operator or a, a, another future operator, um, has, uh, by virtue of the agreement with the DOT, the right to serve customers on the line. The DOT would not um, get in the middle of a rail provider and its relationship with a rail customer. And that, and that relationship is protected by the Interstate Commerce Clause. So, the, so what we would be looking at here, I don't know if that came through in our presentation, would, would be a, a co-location of a trail and, a, and, and maintaining the active freight service on the line. As to, as to the frequency and how the Surface Transportation Board might look at um, a change in use, um, that's an interesting, um, from my experience, that's, it's very much a, um, it's not what you would imagine it might be. For example, um, a, a line that does not see active freight service, meaning uh, there's no freight, ongoing freight service, is still classified as an active railroad. And it's a little counter counterintuitive, and but the Surface Transportation Board process to look at a change in use in the corridor um, considers not only current customers, but prospective customers that may not exist today. So while the biofuels company um, is, is maybe a near-term customer that would want rail service, uh, the Surface Transportation Board also looks at um, other potential um, potential users, in, including adjacent land use. So, for example, to the extent there are, that are uh, commercial properties located adjacent to the line, um, that would be a consideration. There's also a public notice process. So, um, in, in in again in a change in use scenario here, there would be a notice to all potential affected parties and anyone could come forward and say, yeah, I think in the future um, I might need rail service. Uh, so what we're really talking about here is co-location. Um, the regulatory aspects of this are handled by the Federal Railroad Administration. So the actual regulation of the railroad itself is handled by the, the federal government, not the Connecticut DOT. I hope that, that was I hope that covered no, your question. No, that's good. I, thank you for that. And I just have one last question. Uh, the proposed use right now so far, like I said, is for a green energy product uh, to reduce greenhouse gas. It's biofuel. And from what I understand, federal standards do not classify that particular product as a hazardous material. Um, is that your understanding? That, that's, 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 that's correct. correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if the, Councilor Sakala and Deputy Mayor Suzak, Councilor Muller, if the let everyone get a chance first. Go ahead. Thank you. So you may have touched upon this answer when Councilor Suarez asked one of his questions, but is the procedure the same if the town would want to propose just a trail as if we wanted the rail and the trail? Is Are the steps the same and the process the same? So the so, so to, to do, do just, just the trail, trail. Um, that would require going to the federal government um, to do a rail abandonment. Um, it's a, which Rich was just discussing, which would require um, proving to the federal government to the Surface Transportation Board that there is no um, usage or economic viability of that freight line, um, and then. And after that, to the use state property, you would have to follow steps um, in to interact with the DOT to get access to using our state property 
um, that Julie um, laid out. So there would be like a pre-step to even getting to the point of designing the trail. Okay, so it would be almost, all right, so there would be a step before step one and then the rest of it was is really the same. Yeah, it'd be a little okay. slimmed down because we wouldn't have to worry about the safety considerations because the, the rail would be abandoned. So, right. but it'd be, you'd have to go through our rights of way process to acquire rights to build within our right of way or lease it for 99 years or however long we want to uh, build the trail for. Okay. And I'm not advocating for one way or the other at this point. I was just curious on if the steps were the same. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Okay, you stated that you know you inspect the bridges um, periodically. Do you have a date for when the last inspection was on the Scantic River Bridge? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Uh, uh, let's see, it was uh, I think uh, November 2020. So it was last November. Okay, it was last November? Yeah. Okay. And how did it fare on that inspection? It's rated overall fair. Um, there are some minor repairs that need to be done, um, but uh, 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 you know the overall condition of the bridge is is rated fair. Which uh, you know for for comparison um, on our system for the older bridges that we have, that's that's actually pretty good. Um, you know we have you know we have some older bridges that are actually rated four or less. Okay. And that does include the piers and the underground foundation system, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the piers were actually reinforced recently. Um, there is some deterioration up on the bridge seats, um, and that's the subject of one of those uh, repair um, mem memorandums that I talked about. Okay, so I guess you know, we hear a lot from our residents. Why was this railroad, why did it go dormant? And, and not be used for over 25 years. Is there any insight as to why that that happened? I'm going to defer on that one. So my understanding. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so Go my ahead. understanding. John or or Rich or Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, but a portion of the the line is active, right? Um, well, I guess a portion that we're talking about has been dormant for about 25 years. Yeah, and so that would, uh, I mean, it's not due to condition. Um, it would be due to economic um, factors, um, I would say, is probably the reason. So would an analysis be done of the land that is along this, this railroad to see if there, you know, because I guess you would be bringing in raw goods, manufacturing them there, and bringing them out on the train because bringing them in on the train and distributing them from a certain point doesn't lower our truck traffic so i guess you know i really that analysis i i always feel that i'm not fully grasping how it's taking trucks off the road if there's no guarantee that it's raw materials in manufacturing occurs in its raw material and I think that's it for my question. Thank you. Right. But either way, you would if you if you didn't bring if you brought if you didn't have the rail, you would you would have to bring the raw materials in by truck. And so to have a manufacturing facility that um, uses rail that that is incentivized by the use of rail, then you would have truck traffic both ways. And, and this way, um, you would have a uh, truck track going either way. Generally, the rail usage is is um, is uh, an incentive for for um, you know having a rail line, an active rail line, is an incentive for for certain businesses to locate uh, in those areas because uh, they require either bulk materials coming in or they have uh, a lot of materials being shipped out, and so the biofuel is is a really good example of that where you have, you know, a tanker car situation, um, you know, that's very conducive for rail. Um, other places we've seen, uh, you know, we have Home Depots and, and those distribution centers that take, 
you know, the bulk material in and then ship it out uh, to uh, local local businesses and use it as a distribution point. That's another thing. So it would be more distribution centers coming in along the rail line that would use rail coming in and truck going out. Uh, or, or both ways. You could have bulk materials coming in and, and, and manufactured goods going out by rail also. It, it really depends. Okay, thank you. Councilor Muller. I had a quick question under step three for trail design. We hire the consultant and you guys work with them or you guys have consultants and we work with them. How does that work exactly? The municipality uh, preparing the study for trail and it's consultant would develop the plan itself, the department program would be uh, and we would provide the information you have on hand that would be helpful to your consultant. But if it's the municipality would be trust for a trail. So we would look at the building for a trail based upon your preliminary layout. You would review and provide feedback. Thank you. Greetings. Thank you for your presentation tonight. Um, I have a question. Is there a rule of thumb of the distance between a rail and the trail? And who decides if there's enough room to have both? Steve. Would that be the state or the, or the government? Um, John or Steve, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, we did have a, uh, we do have a, um, uh, a suggested separation and and Steve uh, correct do you recall what the number is John I yeah this is Steve Curley uh, usually what we like to do is keep a distance of 25 minimum from the center line of track the nearest yeah. is a single track obviously railroad right away the whole line so what we're at a minimum you're looking usually around 25 feet and that's because railroad still would have to um, you know, repair the, the track structure itself, have room to put machinery, have room to place of materials when they're, when they are repairing the track. Uh, there's also, uh, turnouts and sidings that need room for that. Um, so yeah, we basically at about 25 feet. And, and we do look for some sort of, um, physical separation. It might be a berm. It might be you know, just sort of the, the natural ditch that the that the railroad uses to drain the track bed. Uh, it might be a fence, depending upon the situation. Um, you know, there, there tends to be, you know, the, the downside on these trails is that, you know, there tends to be a degree of complacency. You know, people say, oh, I know that the train train only runs once a week and it comes by on Tuesday and I already saw it. And, and, and you know, lo and behold, uh, you know, the operator you know, has a special shipment and he's coming through on a Thursday. And, and you know, someone's walking on the track bed, train comes around the corner, even at 25 miles an hour, that train can't stop. And uh, somebody trips, somebody falls, and now you have, you know, you have a problem. And it's, it's just, um, you know, we, we need to be absolutely, we need to treat this just like we would any other rail line and, and, and not um, foster that feeling of complacency. And so who would decide if there's enough room for both to exist? Would that be um, a local decision, the state or the government? I, that would be a collaborative discussion between the state and the municipality. Thank you. I had a, quick, a couple quick questions. So did this go back out the bid after 25 years of, no, no, of doing no work on, on the rail? Is there a bid process? How is the current leasee selected? Julie, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, no, not, this does not go out of bid. Uh, primarily because the department is doing a lot of work. We recognize that it's been said that I fully evaluated this, and that's why hiring a consultant, the hiring a consultant to do a study to look at the advantages and disadvantages and to make information. Well, right, right. You mentioned earlier that if a biz, another business wants to t you take, if the rail opens and they want to take advantage of it, there'd be some sort of public process, yet there was no public process here. 
And so, again, I, I guess the, my curiosity is if, if the town didn't start talking about this, would it, would the, I mean, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but would the lease been extended for 20 years like it was called prior? Why the extension for a year? No. In fact, the only thing is for a year to allow the Department of Time to um, prepare uh, a bid for go out to our So are you planning to go out to bid? Well, we're having a consultant review that for us to determine uh, what may be the new stuff when so, we go So over the last 25 years, is there a, how much taxpayer money, if any, has been used on that line? Uh, I'll, take I'll take that. that. Very, very, very little. Um, um, nothing, nothing in the past, past decade. decade. Um, um, as we stated in the outset, outset freight, freight rails, rails are not largely um, supported by, by government. government. They, they actually, actually pay us. us. Right, so I get, but if you have a lease with someone, isn't there a performance part of that lease? I mean, if the rail hasn't opened in 25 years, I mean, didn't the DOT at some point, maybe 15 years in, say, what's going on? I mean, do we relook at it? Do we, I mean, is there an out clause of the lease? I mean, you have to understand, I think we're a little bit curious that it's been dormant for so long. The town has some interest in a trail, and all of a sudden, the rail's going to open. I, I think, um, there's a misconception here. The line hasn't been The one we're talking about has. And, he, and just so you know, East Long Meadow, for example, they're actually, the town mentioned the, the name of the, of, the trail, of the line. They're looking to actually extend their trail down to the Enfield border. So I guess the question is, is so will the train stop at our border? How does it turn around? So uh, I think there's the, the, the key, there's, there's, you're talking about a segment, segment of a rail line, line right? right. Well, um, we're, so we're here talking about Enfield, correct? Yeah. Correct. But, but we've leased, leased a longer, that we've leased, leased the line. line. And, and so, so one, one portion, portion of that line, line is not currently active, active but other, other portions, portions are. are. Got it. But again, I guess, for, you know, for us, we're a little bit frustrated, but, but, you know, that our, and the, 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 the question was earlier about the, but you mentioned the butters would have, you would, you'd speak to the butters if you did a trail. Would you would you speak to the abutters if the rail opens as well? Do they have no. any right? Do they have any rights? The, 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 the railroad existed um, and has rights by federal law. The railroad existed. It's overseen by the Surface Transportation Board. Okay, and then just curious again, on the, not to go back, but on the bridge, has a structural engineer signed off that if that opened tomorrow, it could handle a, an 80 to 100 ton train, whether it's one day a week, two days a week, three days a week? Yeah, that's, that's the purpose of the bridge rating. Is that, um, is, that, uh, is, that um, load rating. is that public information? Uh, I, we can share it. Okay. I appreciate if you would share it with us. I went out there and inspected it myself. The concrete's cracked on three of the columns. There's rebar showing on all four of the columns. Yeah. So I'm just curious. So those, that, those items can be repaired. Yeah, but I'm asking currently, is it structurally safe? I'm not, I understand it can be repaired. And you mentioned earlier that the capital, some of that money could be taxpayer money used to fix the capital, which again, I would have a problem with if, because again, all of us pay state taxes here. And so again, I'd be a little bit concerned if my tax dollars are used to fix a rail, a fix a rail that we can't have a trail on. We well, would. The taxpayer we dollars would. are also used for our roadways in Connecticut. Um, so, just to clarify. True, but and again, and for example, when last time you were coming here to do a project, you actually had a public hearing, and we we actually voted on it whether we wanted it or not. So I just, I'm just curious why this process is different. Because this is uh, grandfathered by federal law. Um, interstate, interstate commerce. commerce. These existed long before um, roadways existed. Okay. The repairs that I mentioned don't rise to the um, level of having uh, Connecticut capital involved. It would be on the railroad to make those repairs. So, meaning to, if they were going to open a rail tomorrow, they could. They could. They, through, they could. A train come through that bridge, and you and DOT would be happy that it's safe. Uh, we, we probably want them to do the repairs in advance. And if by some chance they don't and, the and the, it isn't safe and something happened, who has a liability? Uh, if it's not safe, we wouldn't allow the traffic. Okay. Councilor Riley. <clears throat> okay, so just a couple other questions. Um, does the Connecticut DOT regulate um, the hours of travel? 
that a freight line can go and does it regulate the speed at which the train can travel? What's the maximum speed that the freight uh, train can travel down that particular portion of line in Enfield? No, uh, that's interstate commerce issues, but Rich can talk about that. Okay. Yeah, so just, just as the bridges are load rated, the track is classified for a certain speed. This is um, the, the train speeds and the hours of operation are handled by the carrier in arrangement with the customers. So uh, we, do not, we do not get involved with that. Okay, so it would be not odd if a train came through at midnight if they had people working on the third shift at the plant. They could, yes? That's, That's correct. We, we don't have regulatory uh, oversight over them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my other question is, um, so let's say it, everything happened great and we had a trail with the rail. What, ha what would happen? Who would be responsible if, let's say, the train derailed or it, the cars leaked their product all over and it flowed into the trail. So the cleanup for that would be solely the responsible of the company and the rail owner or would the town have some responsibility since we have a trail there? Well, you know, part, part of this is uh, to how how and the trail assuming that the trail is feasible to be co-located and the nature of the lease agreement um julie can can we predict that or is that all subject to future con contract and liability that will be all the issues that I think, you know, contemplating. I can't, I can't so, hear you. Sorry, sorry, Julie, we're tough to hear you. Yeah. My, so I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at, um, uh, you know, I think when you, when the, uh, when there's a, a surface transportation accident, um, such as a freight derailment, um, it may rise to the occasion of having the National Transportation Safety Board come out and investigate what caused that, um, which would then determine liability. Uh, Steve, do you want to discuss any of those safety type uh, issues? Yeah, so, you know, when it, any of the, whenever there's some kind of derailment or something like that, uh, it, the railroad's required, once again, to report to FRA um, in a certain amount of time, depending on the amount of property damage or, you know, injury uh, that occurs in FRA uh, will, you know, first thing will happen is that obviously clean up and, and getting the train back on the tracks and moving and getting the incident cleaned up is the first thing that happens. Responsibility, uh, usually, uh, uh, the cost of any of that derailment will be the burden of the railroad. Uh, once again, if it's anything really significant, uh, uh, Garrett has mentioned that, you know, other um, federal safety uh, boards come in uh, to do a more thorough uh, investigation uh, of that. But, you know, I mean, usually what happens is the train, these trains first thing are very low speed. We're talking about 10 miles an hour or less. Uh, the, the track, uh, though, in certain portions, you guys may be seeing concrete tires there. Uh, he's, he's or the track's getting upgraded uh, to a certain class of track. Nonetheless, he's not going to be able to allow to be going beyond what the agreement says. And I the existing agreement it has it as upon uh, day to day operations, no more than class two uh, track speed. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know derailment's kind of like out there, but you know if a train car started leaking that you know could be a more 
you know, feasible issue that would happen. And I don't know, like if Deep would have to come out and bring all their hazmat things to dig up the soil and all that. So who would be, you know, footing the bill for something like that? Right. So you're exactly right that if there was any kind of issue with the car that was carrying something that was considered hazardous, uh, you know, Connecticut Deep would be out there with, with the obviously um, Condot too, but Deep would take over the situation. They would do the investigation, do the and Deep is regulatory agency that can hand out fines too. So, you know, they're going to find the railroad or the person that owns the rail car if it was just, you know, the, the car was in poor shape or whatever, if the railroad was just carrying that car, right? It may not be the railroad that actually owns the car, uh, the businesses own the car. So, um, you know, that scenario that happens, uh, once again, it, it's going to be investigated and liability to whoever's at fault. Yeah. All right. So then my last question um, is, let's say other businesses in Enfield that were along the line decided, you know, or they moved in and they want to use the line. So is town zoning responsible for making sure that the business has the correct and proper like runoff tracks and equipment? Or is that something that's between, you know, like, I don't know, DOT or the federal government or, or whatever. So that, that would largely be between the operator of the railroad and the business. Uh, okay. The town doesn't have any. Have town has any say. Okay. Nope. I just had two final questions, and then I'll get to Deputy Mayor Suzak. So the lease. The, the, how, does the state regulate how much he can charge as the leasee to someone who wants to use that line? Or does he have, so is there any, it's interstate commerce, but is there any rules? Or can he basically charge what he wants to use that line? Um, hi, this is Julie. Hopefully you can hear me now I'm on my phone. Um, the, we don't get involved with the business between the railroad and its customer. The only time we would get involved would be um, if they need uh, permission to construct something on state property in order to get a spur track in to facilitate use on the line. Yeah. So to answer your question, no, we would not get into the uh, specific business deal between the railroad and the customer for hauling or for uh, use of the line yeah. for freight. Which makes sense, but again, why would it, I guess why would there be a scenario if there is where we'd be use taxpayer money to fix the line for the leasee? Is there where does the where does the state money come in to help? If we don't regulate what he charges, are we are we using any taxpayer money to fix that line? Uh, as John pointed out before, only in very large, significant structures. Which the bridge um, over to, which the bridge over the Scanic River I think would qualify. Yes, but it's rated fair right now, so it's probably not one that we're going to be adding to our capital plan anytime soon. Oh, okay. And then I think I'll just say that I think that the conversation, I think it was you, Commissioner, that said, you know, you looked at what, what Simsbury did with a trail and what economic development happened there. You know, nice little small businesses, some of those things popped up around the line. And again, if you have a trail, I mean, I'm not against trail, where, as you said, we're trying to bring up the passenger line into Thompsonville. But again, if you do open up a, a, a rail, I mean, I have to sit there and, again, just people need to be up front. It's, you open it up, it's going to be used. So maybe it starts one day a week, that's fine. And I'm not saying I'm not, that's a business's prerogative to make money. And they can, but to sit there and say it's only going to be used one day a week for the next 25 years simply isn't true. And, you know, because again, if other businesses want to use that line, they're going to use that line. And it makes sense for them from an economic standpoint, which is fine. So then the question is for the town, really, what do you want to develop that rural area town? Would you like it something along what you see in Simsbury? Or is it something along where you see in a more industrial type situation where industrial type businesses are going to use the rail? That's, that's, just, the, that's just the question the town has to answer. I mean, and that's fine. I mean, I think that's a fair question for people to answer. What do you want to see for development? I'm not against it. I mean, trust me, I want to see uh, jobs in town, but there's also, we have sections of town for that where that, where that is. 
So I think that's what the, really the question is, what people want, what, what do they want to see developed on that line? Is it more industrial type use or is it more small business rural type economic development? Because there is many phases of economic development that can be used either with a trail or with a rail. And I think if you've walked the line, I mean, I would love to see a trail with a rail. I mean, I'm okay with it. But if you go walk that line, and I recommend members of the DOT to do that, there ain't a whole lot of space there for 25 feet, you know, on many sections of that uh, that, tra that track for safety to have a trail and and uh, a rail. So, so I'm hoping that the DOT does its homework. Because, yeah, again, this is an important subject for us. We waited 25 years to talk about this. And, again, I, I got to admit, I... The fact that you know we, we should be having more public hearings on this because, again, if we lease, if we end up extending that lease, and well, that determines development of that part of town for the next 20 years, and the town should have a say in it, in my opinion. And that's just my statement, uh, Deputy Mayor Suzak. Thanks, Mike. I guess um, I kind of springboard off what um, uh, Councillor Andreyer and what you're saying. Do we know what the right of way is for that rail? Is it the 100 feet that we are seeing in certain portions of the map? Or um, is it varies. It, it, it varies, and that's why it's important for um, the department to share the information concerning the railroad valuation maps with you or your consultant so that they know what the width of the right of way is at given locations all along the line. Right, because 25 feet is, you know, that's a significant part of, you know, 100 feet. I mean, if our widest roadway in, in Enfield is 100 feet, you know, and it, it, it's significant, but, you know, it, and as you know, the mayor was saying, I mean, this is going to change the full complexion of that part of the town. That railroad was there, nobody used it, it went dormant for 25 years. In that 25 years, different things have happened as far as residential development over the There could be significant you know, impact to what happened when there was a perceived um, want non-use of the program. And the fact that you know you didn't see any repairs or anything going on on it for 24 years really led people into a situation where we really don't know what's going on. And I think a lot of the stuff that's been very enlightening that possibly you know understand all the right things way and when they do both. Or do they have <laughs> Donna, you're cutting it out, Donna. Well, I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah. So, um, I guess uh, I've made my statement, and I guess do they have to look at inland wetlands and um, any other regulatory agencies, or are they exempt from them? I would presume no. because no, as part of the review, you, you would, as part of this uh, study or preliminary engineering uh, uh, review, review that would be performed and submitted to CONDOT, one, one of the, uh, a section of it would have to deal with obviously environmental. Yeah, Deputy Mayor, Mayor Suzak, Suzak, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry uh, Commissioner, I, I, folks are cutting in and out. I don't know if uh, we'll let you have, we're at 7.05 or a little bit over. Would you like to, any closing statements, Commissioner? No, I, I would say building a trail would require um, all the similar requirements that uh, uh, you would need to go to DEEP to get permits, and you need to go to Army Corps of Engineers, uh, depending on um, if you need to get permits. Oh, did we lose the town council? No, we're still here. We still see oh, okay. you, Garrett. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, Yep. Um, so, um, so just, just want to clarify that, that point, you would need to go through, just, just as we at the DOT, DOT, when we build a project, um, we, we have, have to go to deep in the Army Corps of Engineers, engineers which is impacting, impacting wetlands. wetlands. So, so um, that, that same, same standards, standards apply. apply. Um, so, so 
appreciate the interest in this. We obviously understand the interest of the community. Um, you know, we need a rail operator to maintain the line, um, but that doesn't preclude other things that the town wants to do in the vicinity or in the rights of way. Um, so the, the path laid out by Julie is one path forward. Um, looking at abandonment is another path forward. Um, but, you know, just to reiterate, um, our job here at the DOT, we're property holders, but the Surface Transportation Board defines whether a railroad can or cannot be shut down. And by shut down, meaning abandoned, because as long as it's not abandoned, it's still considered an active railroad. So anytime a business wanted to start using it, they could. Um, so that's the important thing to keep in mind. Thank you. Again, thank you very much for you, you and your entire staff for being here. We appreciate it. And um, again, hopefully we'll be back in touch and have more more conversations as we move forward. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very all much. for your time. Thank you. Okay. So we're we, we we're late. So I sorry, no break right now. We're moving right into the. Uh, so do I have a motion to close the special meeting? So moved by Councilor Mo. Second. Seconded by Councilor Sakala. in favor by show of hands. Opposed abstention. One, two, three. We have nine people here with Deputy Mayor Suzak. Nine in favor. Excuse me, 10 people here, zero, 10 in favor, zero against. I'm sorry, we got to move right in. We'll have a break right after this to the um, call the Water Pollution Control Authority special meeting Monday, June 7, 2021. It is, we're a little bit late. We're a little bit late. It is 7 7 07. Um, so again, I apologize for we're being late. Um, public hearing, sewer service fees and rates. Sheila, roll call, please. Commissioner Bosco. Here. Commissioner Sakala. Here. Commissioner Crisati. Absent. Commissioner Hemler. Here. Commissioner Ludwig. Here. Commissioner Mangini. Here. Commissioner Commissioner Muller. Here. Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner Sapraza. Here. Commissioner Suzak. Here. Commissioner Ungar. Here. That's 10, 10 members, members present and one after. Thank you, Sheila. We move on to uh, item two, approval of minutes. Special meeting September 21st, 2020. Do we have a motion to approve? So by Councilor Ungar, second, second by Councilor Muller. Is there any correction, deletions, edits? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, abstention. That's 10 in favor, Sheila, zero against. Uh, special meeting May 3rd, 2020, 2021. So we have, moved. We have, uh, second. Motion made by Councilor Riley, seconded by Councilor Muller. Is there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Hearing them by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstention? Ten in favor, zero against. Move on to items to discussion. Discussion resolution, resolution setting the sewer use charge rate of 2021-2022, billing service fees and rates. Okay. Whereas in accordance with Chapter 103, Section 7-255 of the Connecticut General Statutes, the Enfield Water Pollution Control Authority held a virtual public hearing on June 6, 2021 at 6.50 p.m. and has accepted the comments on a proposed 21-22 sewer service fee schedule. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Enfield Sewer Authority does hereby adopt the service sewer service fee schedule attached here to as attachment A, prepared by the town manager's office on May 13, 2021. So moved. By Councilor Mangini, seconded by, excuse me, by Commissioner Mangini, seconded by Commissioner Muller. Good news, I mean, we're not, pa we're actually having a pass for the sewer fees. For That's the first correct. time in three years, right? I think it's important to note yep. that there will be no increase. We'll be the same rates across the board as last year. Uh, John Wilcox, the Director of Finance, is here and available to answer any questions, but I think that's probably what was on most people's minds. Yep. So, John, it's if status you were, quo. John, if you want to come up real quick, I know there might be a couple questions. There had been a question about um, collection rates, and John right. has that information, absent any other questions. Welcome, sir. Uh, Director of Finance, John Wilcox. So, anything you want to say in a short fee before we open up the questions? Um, I have nothing to uh, add. I mean, there, we, we, we've uh, um, 
been able to hold hold the budget down enough over the last couple of years that we've uh, built up enough of our fund balance that I think um, at the end of this year we'll end up with a positive fund balance for the first time in I think 15 to 20 years, something like that. Amazing. So before we open the questions, we how much can you high level? We were in a deficit four years ago of X, and now we're. I mean, so um, how far we've come in four years? Uh, we should be about, uh, we were about even at the end of the last fiscal year. And we started off about, what wasn't it, like $4 million in a hole? About, yeah, about $4 right. million. $4 that million was... in a hole. Right, again, we did it systematically, organized, and we, we tried to keep it as, as even-handed as possible. Over, I understand people are going to argue with that, but, again, we certainly didn't go after it all at once. And I think, uh, very importantly, we'll uh, be announcing that we'll uh, be having a ribbon cutting June 25th right. at the Water Pollution Control to celebrate the reopening and a $36 million plus um, upgrade to the system. That was done by this council through local, state, and federal monies. Very important to br bring us into compliance with all of the federal and state mandates, which we were not. Um, it was two years. It was a long, arduous process. I give credit again to the Water Pollution Control folks. I also will say that we did have a NOVAC report that looked at recommendations at Water Pollution Control and Public Works. And true to its word, the council has implemented those changes at the Department of Public Works with great success. And this year, we added an additional person to Water Pollution Control within our budget um, to address the NOVAC report. Because to spend that much money on a plan and then not have somebody and the appropriate staff to oversee it and maintain it is foolish. So we're looking to the future. It also is important because it expands the uh, capability of that water pollution control facility for us to entertain growth, not only residentially, but commercially and industrially. And that puts us apart from many area communities which have not kept up right. and they are impeded in economic growth because they don't have water uh, pollution control uh, uh, growth potential in their uh, facility. We do. Uh, we're open for business, so it's 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 very uh, appropriate. And I'm glad we were able to hold the rate steady. That we're in such good fiscal condition there. And uh, we'll be announcing the ribbon cutting for whomever would like to come out and join us on that date and time. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Suzak, Ken Den, Councilor Sakala. Mike, you didn't have the public hearing, or unless I missed it. The public hearing should have been first before we started the meeting. It's not on the agenda. According to the agenda, I have. I'm sorry, I apologize on the way. And She's correct. It says 645 public hearing first, and the notice is there. So I would just put the word behind anyway, so I would just take a hiatus and open it for the public hearing. Yeah. So again, sorry, John. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. By Councilor second. Caller, seconded by Council Mangini. Councilor Caller, when we get out, you have the first question. Sorry about that. It was in the small print, so go ahead. I didn't even see it, sorry. Usually there's like a legal notice yeah. or something. It's in there. Okay. Donna, thank you. All right. I have, I have so, to thank my citizens. Uh, they, see, they're good. All right, so June 7, 2020. Um, uh, Public hearing ground rules. A public hearing has been scheduled to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the proposed sewer service fee and rates for fiscal year 21-22. Roll call, please, Sheila. Commissioner Bosco. Here. Commissioner Sakala. Here. Um, Commissioner Crisati is absent. Commissioner Hemler. Here. Commissioner Ludwig. Here. Commissioner Mangini. Here. Commissioner, Commissioner Muller. Here. Commissioner, Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner Sopraza. Here. Commissioner Suzak. Here. Commissioner Unger. Here. Ten, Ten members, members present, one absent. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, the following notice of public hearing was published in the Hartford Current on Tuesday, May 25th, 2021. Town of Enfield Legal Notice. The Enfield Water Pollution Control Authority shall conduct public hearing in the town council chambers at town hall 820 enfield street enfield connecticut on monday june 7th 2021 at 6 45 p.m we're a little late to allow interested residents an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the proposed sewer fee sewer service fee and rates for fiscal year 21 22 information can be found in the office of the town clerk at www.enfield-connecticut.gov 
Uh, Sheila M. Bailey, town clerk, dated May 25th, 2021. Our ground rules for this public hearing, there is no time limit, but we ask each person not to take up too much time so everyone has the opportunity to speak. After each person who, deser who desires to speak has one chance, we shall permit those individuals a second. After those individuals desire a second time, we shall permit those individuals a third, fourth, etc. Please refrain from personalities. So this public hearing specifically for the sewer fee, anyone would like to speak before the council about the, s the sewer fee? They're pending uh, 21, 22 sewer fee. And I'd like to speak about the sewer fee to be specific. And basically we would have uh, recounted right. the same information we just did that the fees aren't going up, they'll be the same as last year. So it's a, yeah, so you're having no increase in the sewer fees. The second time, I would like to speak before on the sewer fees. One more time, a third time. Hearing none, I declare this public, uh, public, public hearing closed. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the public hearing? By motion Councilor to Mueller, adjourn. Seconded by Councilor, um, Commissioner Mangini, all, all those in favor? Opposed, abstention. Ten in favor, Sheila, zero against. So the public hearing has been conducted. Again, now we move to the regular meeting. Um, again, Water Pollution Control Authority, special meeting, Monday, June 7, 2021. Um, do I have uh, Sheila, roll call? Commissioner, Commissioner Bosco. Bosco. Four. Commissioner Sakala. Here. Commissioner Cassati is absent. Commissioner Hemler. Here. Commissioner Ludwig. Here. Commissioner Mangini. Here. Commissioner Muller. Here. Commissioner Riley. Here. Commissioner Sarkraza. Here. Commissioner Suzette. Here. Commissioner Ungar. Here. Ten members present, one absent. That may be my first Roberts rule error in four years. Um, so listen, so I think we're gonna, we're still gonna have to go. So Sheila, I mean, so technically, I'm gonna go through the minutes again. I wanna make sure we do this, right? Sheila, I wanna be sure. here. Yeah. I think we should. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll, yeah. open, and then I'll open up, I'll open up to uh, Councillor Sakala. So again, special meeting. Do I have a motion to approve September 21st, 2020? Well, by Councilor Second. Mahler, seconded by Councilor Ungar. Is there any additions, deletion, or corrections? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, abstentions? 10 in favor, zero again, Sheila. Special meeting, May 3rd, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. By Councilor Riley, seconded by, Council by Councilor Mangini. All those in favor, by show of hands? Opposed, abstention? Nine in favor, zero against? Item three, uh, discussion resolution. Resolution setting the sewer fee usage charge of 2021-22. Where is in accordance with chapter 103, section 7-255 of the Connecticut General Statute, the Enfield Water Pollution Control Authority held a virtual public hearing on June 6, 2021. At June, excuse me, I'll have to re reform, it's gonna be June 7th at 650 and accepted uh, comments in a pr uh, proposed 21-22 sewer service fee schedule. Now therefore be it resolved, the Enfield sewer, sewer, Enfield sewer Authority does hereby adopt the sewer service fee schedule attached herein as attachment A. Town manager approved by the town manager's office on May 13th, 2021. So moved. By Councilor Muller. Second. By Councilor Riley. Commissioner Riley, Commissioner Sakala, you have your hand up. Yes. Okay. So. Nobody wants a, a rate increase, so I'm going to preface my question with, with that. So a year or two ago, we all voted to do half of the increase, I believe, last year and then half the increase this year because we have been behind and not charging enough and running on a deficit. So is not doing an increase, because we've done this before, is not doing an increase this year now going to set people up for sticker shock when we do this next year because we've we've been in this position before where we haven't raised rates and then we circle around and go well we haven't been charging enough for the last five years so now we're going to double your rate right and that's not what we want to do so i don't want to raise them at all but what i don't want to do is be in this position next year and we have to double it or whatever in order to make up for the fact that we didn't do the raise that we agreed upon for this year? That's a very good question. John, I think it's started to answer that. Uh, when he made the predictions last year, that was the scenario in our recommendation. But as he just, well, he explained and he can elaborate a little further, now that he has the information from last year, we, we were in a better position, which enabled us to be able to make this uh, year without a rate increase. But John, if you could just answer that directly. It's a very good question. Yes. Um, 
we we had projected um, greater increases in expenditures based on the uh, Woodard and Curran studies than we have actually found that we've had. So we made up our some of our fund balance deficit uh, sooner than I th think we anticipated that we would have, um, and I think that we can. Um, you know, we we did have large increase last year, and I think we can we can hold the rate steady, um, and, and you know we'd have to evaluate next year uh, based on our collections and everything where where we are and whether we need to you know how much of an increase we would need for next year. Okay, so I just want to make clear, and being in a good or a better position is is right. It's what we want, but we're not just putting a band aid on it to hit people with an excessive height next year, right? No, that's, that's, that's not our intent. Okay. If we had thought that were the case, we would have recommended uh, to implement the other increase this year. But as John said, when the actual numbers came in, we were in a much better position. Not only that, but we were actually we're, we're so much better. As he said, it's for the first time we were fiscally sound in the last 15 years. So it's very prudent. Our, our numbers are very strong in the budget overall and our reserve fund. So this is a very appropriate and calculated um, and measured response. Good. Um, it's just good like, news. Just I like, just, just like water pollution optimistic. control there, there's an ebb and flow, and we never know uh -huh. exactly until so we get funny. the so, uh, information. Before I go to Deputy Mayor Suzak, could you explain to people two things help this? Again, this council and your and your staff, Donald's staff, we went out and got the $2.5 million that the state owed us. Again, we took how long to get that money? That money came, I think, last year. One And the other thing, also let people know, and I know we've had to suspend it a little bit, but how successful we have been about collecting people, collecting unpaid sewer fees, which, again, I think was one of the drivers, the reason why we fell behind. So not the, not the main, but a big reason why we fell so far behind. I don't know if you can give rough numbers, but I know that was also two things the public should know, that the town has done you know, aggressively over the last three years. Um, yes, you are correct. Um, we, our total accounts receivable balance at the end of, uh, of uh, 2019 was uh, about a million eight hundred forty thousand um, dollars. That has decreased uh, to about one point seven million dollars uh, now. That's total outstanding balance. Um, <clears throat> the over 90 day portion of the balance at the end of June in 2019 uh, was about 823,000, um, almost 824,000. Um, that has, uh, it went down to $700,000 in 2020, and we did suspend our uh, referral to collections a little bit in 2021. Uh, we, we restarted that in April, but it has increased a little bit to, to uh, $791,000 at the end of May. Which is, which is so part important that, again, the people who are paying their taxes, we're not penalizing them. We're actually people who weren't paying. And again, everyone struggles, and there's no, but we actually were very even-handed to say, look, you have to pay your fair share like everybody else. That's correct. Yeah. Um, we have reported um, almost 1,000, 922 uh, bills to be exact. Um, our, our process is where right now we're looking, to, we, we issue about 60, 60 to 65,000 bills a year for right. sewer. Um, and so there's a large number in, in order to uh, create you know, the biggest bang for the buck. We, we have reported bills that are over $1,000 right. to a state marshal uh, for a collection. We have referred 922 bills. Um, of those, 755 have been paid in full. Um, we've collected a total through uh, May 31st of about a million four hundred fifty-two thousand dollars. It's those. funny, finance isn't exciting, but that's exciting stuff, you know. And and that's, I mean, again, th those little things matter, and that's why, knock on wood, you know, we're not going to be asking for a big increase. And I can't think Councilor Sakala is right. Last year, through everything we did, we did pass on an increase last year, even though it was a difficult decision to make. So I agree with her, but I think. But these other things that people are doing that we started three to four years ago now are starting to come to fruition. And, and again, it's important. And again, to go from a $4 million deficit to now hopefully we're going to start building up our reserves without just going after it all at once, which a lot of times usually you have the ebb and flow. You're, you hit the, the barrel and everyone goes up to the top and goes and gets it. We built it over a four-year period, very even keel. 
And I go, I understand it's a sensitive subject. People think they're paying too much for it. So I'm not going to dismiss that. But it wasn't like we went all after it in the first two years. We've well, taken, and I'll just you know, say, Mr. Mayor, that, you know, we had to do this at the point of a sword from the DEP. Right. People don't recall that, you know, because of the violation, numerous violations we had there, we were facing multi-million dollar fines per year if we didn't do the upgrade and then spin off. You know, it's interesting before when when it was subsumed in your municipal tax bill, nobody noticed it. It was just part of the bill. And when the DEP required us and the federal government to, to break away, we had to send separate bills. So the, t the council has looked at it. They continue to try to be equitable. But I will also say that that I think it's hopeful with the new upgraded plant that it will be more efficient. We were spending sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for repairs because the plant was failing. So hopefully with good management and maintenance, we'll avoid those in the future. As you said, this isn't the most exciting or sexy subject. I probably would wager if I were a betting man, that the ribbon cutting for the Water Pollution Control Center won't have as many folks as the uh, everyone's ribbon excited. cutting. Everyone's for, excited. Every commissioner the, here is excited. For the splash pad. There probably would be more people at the splash pad. I mean, it the, has the, but remember, it has the highest capacity plants in this region. Yep. And I, I, and I know that's hard to understand, but that's so important when it comes to, again, economic development. And, and not to mention residential development as well. So sorry, Deputy Mayor Suzak, you've had your hand up. You've been patient. Go right ahead. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Mike. I guess, I guess the, other the other thing that I want everybody to, to consider, and I think right. maybe we should look at, is, is the bonding. Um, bonding is um, the interest rates are a lot lower now than probably what the Woodard and Kern had predicted that we would be bonding money for. So if that, you know, next time we look at sewer rates and things like that, if we can have an analysis of that, John, that would be really helpful. Well, thank thank you. you. Anyone else have any questions for John? Is there anything else in closing? No, I have nothing else. Man, man of many words. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, Sheila, roll call, please. Commissioner, Commissioner Bosco. Bosco. For the second time, four. <laughs> <laughs> Commission, did he say? She, she didn't know how to respond. To that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sheila, that was a yes from Commissioner Bosco. That was, okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Sakala. Four. Commissioner, Commissioner Hemmler. Four. Commissioner Ludwig. Four. Commissioner Mancini. Four. Commissioner Muller. Four. Commissioner Riley. Four. Commissioner Sopraza. Four. Commissioner Souza. Four. Commissioner Ungar. Four. That's 10 in favor, none against. Thank, no you, she Thank you, Sheila. Item B under uh, items for discussion. Resolution authorizing the town manager to execute a community sewerage system agreement with the Shaker Heights Homeowners Association, Inc. Whereas the Shaker Heights Homeowners Association, Inc. owns and operates a private sanitary sewer system, which is connected to the town's publicly owned sewer system. And whereas the State of Connecticut Department of Environmental, of Energy and Environmental Protection, also known as DEEP, has required an agreement in conformance with the provisions of Connecticut General Statute Section 7-246F to ensure the effective management of the system, which includes the operation, maintenance, Maintenance, repair, and improvement of the system by the association as required by as required under subsection 7-246 FC and whereas the town Enfield staff, Enfield Town staff, and the Shaker Heights Homeowners Association, Inc. have mutually negotiated such an agreement. Now therefore be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council authorizes the town manager to execute the agreement upon the council's behalf prepared by the Department of Public Works on March 4, 2021. So, so moved. By Councilor Mangini, seconded by Councilor Ungar. Pretty, I don't, know, I don't know if Donald wants pretty straightforward. But, yeah, you can come uh, up. It's more exciting yeah. stuff. This is, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's been reviewed by the town attorney. It's provided for under state law, um, and it's favorable to the town uh, based upon the review of the town attorney, and he's available for questions as well. Donald, just name and title, and just really high level what this is. Yeah. Donald Noons, Director of Public Works. Uh, there's no way it can compete with John on this one. So uh, basically it says that they have their own sewer system, and they maintain it. We have our sewer system. We maintain it. And where the two come together, we agree that that's where the two come together. And it's basically separating the, the two of us apart and make sure that DEEP knows that the Shaker Heights is maintaining their system and we are maintaining ours. That's It's just, it's a lot of legalese for basically yep. that. Appreciate it. Any yep. questions for Donald? Any questions? 
Councilor Bosco? Commissioner so, Bosco, uh, excuse me. We don't own their sewers, then. They have to take care of them and dig their roads up and everything. Yes, if they something goes wrong. Yes, oh, good. that's correct. Thank you. Commissioner, any other commissioner comments? Thank you, Donald. Roll call, please, Sheila. Commissioner Bosco. Four. Commissioner Sakala. Four. Commissioner Hamler. Four. Commissioner Ludwig. Four. Commissioner Mangini. Four. Commissioner Muller. Four. Commissioner Riley. Four. Commissioner Sufraza. Four. Commissioner Souza. Four. Commissioner Ungar. Four. It's 10 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Thank you, Sheila. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. By Councilor Second. Muller, seconded by Councilor Riley. All those in favor, by show of hands. Opposed, abstention. That's 10 in favor, zero against. You have five, four minutes. We're going to take a quick recess in the general meeting. The general meeting will start at 7.34. You have four minutes.
Are we ready? All right, so uh, again, we apologize for the delay. It's 7.34. This is Monday, June 7th, 2021. This is the regular meeting of the Enfield Town Council. Uh, prayer, Councillor Bosco. Dear Lord, as we begin the summer of 2020, we found ourself, ourselves in the middle of a pandemic with many people suffering from COVID, business closing, kids getting their education from home, and people living in isolation. One year later, our nation is healing. People are getting back to work and life is getting back to normal. So today we give thanks. We're thankful for the scientists who created the vaccine. We're thankful for our medical personnel, first responders, teachers, and all who gave their time to keep our community moving. And we are thankful that we can change uh, fist bumps and hugs. May, may your loving hand continue to keep us safe and may show, show compassion to all those who lost loved ones in the past year. In our Lord's name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sheila, one more time. Roll call, please. Councilor Bosco? Here. Or should I Councilor say four? Proud. Here. <laughs> Councillor Crisati, absent. Councillor Hamler. Here. Mayor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Mangini. Here. Councillor Muller. Here. Councillor Riley. Here. Councillor Safraza. Here. Deputy Mayor Souza. She is logged off, Sheila. She's logged off. Okay, yep. thank you. Councilor Angayer. Here. That's nine members present, two absent. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, item four in the agenda, fire evacuation announcement. In case of a fire, we have the exit doors right at the back of the, of the council chambers. Please, in an orderly fashion, go out those doors, either left or right. We also have the doors to our left. The audience is right. You go out those doors. There'll be a door right in the hall. You go out down that door, down through the uh, stairway, and out the doors into the parking lot in an orderly fashion in case of a fire. Item five, minutes of the preceding meetings. Do I have an approval for special meeting May 17th, 2021? So moved. So moved. By Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Mangini. Do I have any additions, deletions, or corrections? Heard him by show of hands. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstention? Uh, eight in favor, one abstention. Sheila? Uh, regular meeting May 17th, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. By Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Riley. Is there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Hearing none by show of hands. All those in favor? Opposed, abstention, eight in favor, zero against, one abstention, Sheila. Moving on to item six in the agenda. Special guest, we welcome our uh, Director of Public Works, Donald Nunes. Welcome, sir. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, good evening. Uh, Donald is gonna do two presentations this evening. The first one is on the upcoming uh, referendums for the fall and we've dubbed them the three R's, uh, roads, roofs, and recreation. Um, we wanted to give an overview of the time frame because clearly deadlines are critical to this, to have it uh, successfully on the ballot in November. Um, we'll start with each one. He's just gonna give a brief, brief synop a synopsis. We're gonna do a more in-depth presentation uh, on this presentation at the next meeting, but we wanted to get people starting to think about it. So if council has questions or anybody at home, they can start forwarding them to us before we actually do a public hearing in July. Um, so Don will do this. It's only gonna take about 10 minutes and then we'll have a more in-depth presentation in June. Well, hopefully Donald will do it in about <laughs> 10 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have a more in-depth on each one of these R's uh, in June, and hopefully then the public hearing the first meeting in July. Give us plenty of time to vet it, and if there are any changes to be made, we can do them before the final question is adopted for the ballot. Donald? Welcome, Donald. Good evening, welcome. So again, we're talking about the three R's, roads, roofs, and recreation. And again, this is all centered around infrastructure and leisure activities for the town. So I'm gonna to first start with roads. We're proposing, again, we're working it out through the DPW subcommittee, a $30 million road program. We started in 2018 with a road condition survey, as we do before every single referendum to see where we are, where we're going, and where we still need to uh, address going forward. Uh, 
this this methodology includes roads on the complaint list which we have maintained uh, over the last five years and that includes from counselors from phone calls from emails from residents it goes everything together so we included those it also includes roads to complete neighborhoods treated in previous referendums now again sometimes we go go through drive through a neighborhood and there's only one or two streets left we pick those up it was that kind of thing just to get that neighborhood done um, we included roads with a PCI of 60 or lower in this program. We also had a, a, a large proponent of it or a large portion of this is to continue the preventative road maintenance program, <clears throat> such as arterials and collectors of doing that and getting the most bang for the buck. We've considered the most cost effective design alternatives, starting with reclamation first all the time instead of digging up roads. Um, and doing the more aggressive treatment so we always start with that uh, we considered our complete streets policy which council passed uh, several years ago and to councillor bosco's point we are looking at alternative uh, designs based upon our ms4 permit requirements where we we will probably not be curbing areas this year we're reducing road widths to help uh, again get us in compliance with ms4 and we're also working with uh, public utilities including our own sanitary sewer um, system so I'm not going to go through I'm not going to read the list but uh, on in the white were the everything in a complaint list the blue is recommended by staff <clears throat> the bold uh, is arterials and collectors so right now we have 49 street segments and one section of sidewalk uh, on Abbey Road so that is for the roads referendum right there Moving on to roofs, uh, it's $13.7 million uh, program that we want to have. We've compiled the townwide roofing survey. We used the building department data to verify roof ages. We did site investigations uh, with town staff, with Jeffrey and a roofing expert and Mark. We did all these things to get up on, on the roofs themselves. All investigations use non-destructive methods, so we're not digging or prying through things. Everything, again, non-destructive. And the list was prioritized on overall condition and failure, how that and how that would impact operations and business disruption for a school or for any other thing. So that was really the most important part of it. Um, and without a referendum, there's multiple CI projects, CIP projects at pre-referendum levels. So a building like Barnard, we were doing it would take three years to do that because we were we were. We were funding it at five at pre-referendum limit. We could only get so much roof with that, so it took us three years to get that done. We don't want to do that. We'd rather just knock it off in one that one roof in that one year. It cuts down on contractors and inflation and, and the like. Um, out of that $13.7 million roof investment, approximately $5.8 million will be reimbursed by the state. And we are we will be replacing approximately four hundred six thousand square feet of roof over both the Town of Enfield and Board of Ed properties over the five years. And this is gonna position us uh, to also invest for future roof replacements as well as we were doing smaller ones. So with that, we're doing Parkman, the Public Safety Complex, Stowe, Alcorn, Crandall, Enfield Street, and the Annex. So that's the largest of the, of the bunch. All right, I'm going to give a preamble before Donald uh, hits this one, because this one actually is exciting. Um, <laughs> it's tough to make roofs exciting, but for our guests and people at home, just, it's very expensive to have to fix roofs and the damage uh, when they leak. So it's important that we look at the the uh, the roof referendum and consider it uh, this fall. This recreation um, referendum is exciting, and I'm glad we have a lot of young families and um, youngsters here today because it's going to directly benefit you. I just want to be able to share, Mayor, what we've done this past year and what's going to happen this summer, and we'll talk about this. Um, this is a wish list, but what the council has previously funded in the fall and in this budget, which is going to be built this year, we're doing a Higgins Park behind the town hall, which will have a one-third and a quarter mile walking trail with training stations. The Santa Albert School, they completely funded next door, a rehabilitation of that 
uh, facility for three quarters of a million dollars. So we'll have an indoor 9,000 square foot for basketball, volleyball, um, pickleball, and a climbing wall. Uh, also a stage area. And behind Town Hall, we also have funded, as I said, there will be a state-of-the-art $200,000 playscape, which hopefully will be in by August. Also an outdoor basketball court. Down in Lafayette Park, we funded and will have built this summer an outdoor basketball court and a new playscape. Over at, Laf uh, over at um, Alcorn, uh, we also have a brand new outdoor basketball court and there's a playscape there. So those are a lot of amenities for you and young people, but very exciting. We've started a program and it's going to be directly bearing on this referendum in the fall. The council funded for a splash pad at Parkman School. We've appropriated the money. It's been designed and hopefully it'll be in in August. And now we'll segue into this. These are the things that the council wants to do behind Higgins Park and other areas of the town. And Donald will go through that. And this will be for your consideration and other voters uh, for this summer. Donald? Hard to compete. <laughs> it's hard to beat that one, Mayor. So. Um <clears throat> yeah, like Chris said, it's going to be the center. It's like a water park while you're at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, you know, Higgins Park is projected to be the central hub, you know, for active and passive rec recreation. Like you said, including the walking trail, the playscapes, the pool, the splash pad, band shell, and the fitness stations out <clears throat> off of the actual walking trail that's around it. So, again, this, rec this referendum recognizes the need for more recreational opportunities in town, not just in Thompsonville. Uh, we, it replaces the former uh, Lamagna Center pool at Higgins Park with a state-of-the-art zero-entry 25-meter pool, separate splash pad, and bathrooms. It installs splash pads at three other locations throughout town. Um, the lion's share of this is, again, is the pool. Uh, it's going to be about $4.25 million. That's what we're projecting. The three splash pads at about 125 parking and the band shell makes up the $5.25 million uh, referendum. And as I said, it'll be exciting to have a 25-meter pool behind Town Hall uh, together with the bathrooms that Gene wanted to make sure we included with a splash pad, all within walking distance. And I'll tell you, because the council uh, leased and we have an option to buy the Enfield Express two doors down, we have adequate parking. I know the frustration for a lot of people is you come to an event and you have to walk two miles. We are going to be able to actually offer triple the parking behind town hall because we have uh, bought the two acres next door so this council has been very visionary looking forward to things i know we have to do roads we have to do roofs it's kind of tough to get these three tights in the front row excited about that but you tell them there's going to be pools and splash pads and playscapes i think that that's exciting so i'm glad you were all here and you can share the news and hopefully you can come out and support the referendum in november so I'm so, glad you're here. So just so I, if we have high level questions, we're going to have a full presentation of all three next week, prof, basically about an hour presentation. If you want to hold your more detailed questions for next week, any just comments, save your questions. And we're going to have a full pre presentation on all three. So we get it ready to discuss for the public hearing in the summer, as the town manager said. Again, the goal, I think we are remember just remind our drop dead date to get it on the ballot is September. That doesn't mean if we're happy in August, we can have a special meeting and vote for it then. We can talk about that as the summer unfolds. But again, so we'll have the full presentation next week. July is when we'll uh, you know, have a hopefully, if July or even August, depending on how it shakes out, but August is a drop dead day for public hearing so people can give us their feedback. So I'll stop talking there. Any other high I think the questions? timeline, Donald, did you have that in the slide? We handed it out, so. Okay, no, and so we I have just, the time. That's more knows, right? that's so, more uh, inside baseball, but yeah. we have the time frame. We're working with the town attorney, and we have an internal working group meeting every single week, so we don't miss anything. So again, uh, so the public knows we'll have a, this will be on our agenda on the twenty first. Um, I think at least for this part, we're going to let you off the hook for detailed questions. We'll save them for next Monday. Okay, thank you. All right, no the, problem. The second presentation has been quite a uh, bit of interest, and we have guests here this evening who I'm sure are going to speak to this. You know, we have a. a constant um, question we have a constant um demand for fields in town in all of the sporting events. Last year, unfortunately, there was no demand because we weren't able to play. Uh, this year, um, everything is open, and so we see from softball to baseball to Little League uh, and 
to soccer a demand for fields. Unfortunately, we, we have a, a larger demand than we do have availability and supply of fields. So what we're doing, we're just going to give an overview tonight because I hope it'll give some of the, the answers to the folks that are here when they ask questions and the folks at home. It's tough to make everybody happy because, again, it's a limited resource. What I can tell you is we, this year, due to the renovations at JFK, we are down fields, and that's had an impact. Also, with the reopening, there's a demand. Everybody wants to go out and, and play and be involved, and that's great. And also, you know, when you have different leagues form and, and different teams come forward, uh, there's more people for less fields. So it's a thankless job that Mark Gar does to have to try to balance these interests under the existing field use policy, which the council um, had adopted and changed a little bit uh, before the pandemic. And what the, I can assure the folks here, uh, this Thursday and at home, we're going to have this. We have a public work subcommittee where we work on issues more in depth before they come to the council. And there's three areas that we're going to ask you to look at. And part of it is addressing this situation. Uh, the field use policy is a first come, first serve uh, basis. So that if somebody initially at the beginning of the season is quick out of the gate, they can, re you know, uh, reserve a lot of fields. If there's a demand or other leagues or fields that, or, or teams that come forward later, it's tougher for them to get access. So Mark has to try to balance that. I think what I'm suggesting, given the demand and the proliferation of leagues, you know, when I played soccer, which it's hard to believe it was a million years ago, um, you played for your, you know, your, your school. That was it. Uh, when my kids played, I know what you're going through. You had travel and you had premiere and you had all kinds of other demands for fields. So we have a, a finite resource and a lot more demand today for that. So what I'm going to ask uh, Thursday and we'll meet for the consideration of the subcommittee is maybe there's going to be more equity. I really believe uh, across the board we need a field uh, subcommittee of the council. We need to look at the inventory and the way that we divvy out the fields uh, to, so perhaps we can do it in a more equitable manner during the winter and the off months so people can come in and get an equitable distribution of the field so they're not shut out. Um, that's number one. Number two, we're looking, as you know, uh, one of the items this evening in executive session, and that's during the confidential part of the meeting um, due to real estate. You know, we are looking to expand and have a uh, a field complex system for the town of Enfield. So I presented something this evening which would involve adding, well, how many fields, Donald, in all? <clears throat> There's uh, 13 11 11s, 10 9 by 9s, and four softball diamonds. So we're looking to expand in all the different sporting events looking forward, and we have an, an, an area in mind, so we're going to be pursuing that. The council gave us authority to do it, so we'll report. We're trying to increase the supply for the demand. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to look again at the nonprofit status of the policy and the insurance provisions. We require insurance. Mark's not a lawyer or an insurance agent, and these questions come up with the certificates. And luckily, through finance, we have an insurance broker, and we're going to ask them to vet those issues. If somebody submits these things and someone has a question as to the validity or the adequacy, they're going to do that for us. But we understand the demand. We understand the need. We're trying to balance it. It doesn't always make everybody happy. It's one of the most frustrating parts of the job for me and for the staff, and I know for you, those who want to use the field. So we're trying to address it. Your uh, concerns are, are being looked at. And with that, Donald will do a short presentation. Again, it's not to um, say anything's right or wrong or perfect. He's just going to sort of give a thumbnail of the, the scope of the problem. And then when the folks come up to speak, hopefully we'll have a good picture of the situation. Thank you. Go right ahead, sir. You want to? Uh, you got the Mark, just your title and go ahead. Right ahead. Mark Gar, facilities manager uh, for the town of Enfield. Uh, Donald put some slides together uh, with the two uh, soccer organizations. Um, we've got Mark Twain on the screen. Um, there's two fields. Um, there's the uh, 11 v 11, and I'm sorry, I'm not a soccer person. What's the smaller one? 9, 9 v 9? 9 v 9. Um, that's at Mark Twain. These fields are not in the best shape. They don't have irrigation. Um, all of our fields, whether it be baseball, soccer, anything, are run from April, a lot of times March, until the third week of November. So um, wherever we go, we're overlapping, and and we can't grow grass in, in November and December. Um, so some of these fields, as you can see, need a little bit of attention. Um, so this is Mark Twain and, and the 
soccer association has these has this complex. <clears throat> Right, and also they said they're they're they have scheduled it for me from April through November, uh, Monday through Fridays, five to eight, and Saturday. So it's basically it, it, this is a seven day week facility that is dedicated to Infield Soccer Association. Uh, the same goes for Nathan Hale. There's two fields here in the in the back of Hale, um, and that's through April through November. So Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So this this these fields are dedicated for the Infield Soccer Association solely. Infield High School uh, in June, from June through August, uh, we are we have striped this field differently. If you notice, if you can tell that there's a soccer field in, in this orientation here and another one here, uh, due to the fact that there's baseball being played here, we could not give them these two fields because this is in the outfield. So if you follow that line, the balls are going to be there. So we striped the field, just one field right there. We also have to give them access to um, the turf field. So this is another facility dedicated to the to the soccer association. You might want to. Okay. This comes back to soccer. If you can see both of the small uh, the indents of the small fields. Those are soccer fields. Those are right. soccer fields right. in the fall for the BOE. So right. those fields will be back available. Uh, this this one we put in is just for the June um, uh, June through August. Um, yep what they're looking for. So there will be those fields back in. And there'll um, be people playing baseball too, right? They try to play baseball in the fall. Unfortunately, we, we're, we lose most of it. Got it, okay. So we're scrambling for 90-foot diamonds in the fall because... And this is June to August, and when's football start for the high school? August 16th. August 16th. All right, so August 16th they start, and that all has to be done. Doesn't the band use that as well? All right. The band uses it. Um, yeah. Okay. You can, I'm sorry, you can see um, upper right, you can see the yep. practice football field. Yep. There's a field hockey field below that. Uh, the band uses the practice field right. on the upper left. That's where the band practices. That all has to be back in by. And when it rains, that gets pretty darn money out there. Yeah, that's yep. going to be done by August 16th is when they. Yep. No, thank you. Start. Yep. So to that end, Mr. Mayor, when, that's why we can, we can only give this up to the no, eighth because no, we got no. we need transition time no. to convert these fields back, and striping is, isn't a, a five minute, you know, no, five no, minute no. job. No. So uh, this is the Shaker uh, Recreation Facility. So right now we have, uh, through working with with the town manager and both associations, uh, it was decided that the Infield Soccer Association have the 11 by 11 field here on Mondays and Fridays only to help with their uh, field allotments. And the Enfield Soccer Club has this field Tuesday through Thursday and on Saturdays and Sundays along with all their other fields that they have here. So they are sharing this facility, this, this field only on this facility uh, two days a week. So again, the Enfield Soccer Association has it Monday, Friday and the club has it the remaining days. And Hazardville, uh, both fields here are dedicated to uh, Hazard to the infield soccer club, uh, basically April through November, seven days a week. So this is dedicated to them. So that's where our, our state of the state of the soccer fields are and who's on where with them right now based upon our facility use policy and, and recommend it. And, yep reservations that he's that Mark's received any questions for Donald or Mark Councilor Sakala I just have one so back to Shaker two fields two days a week for ESA and field soccer club gets the rest of the fields for the rest of the, how many other fields are there how many fields total that'll answer my question it, it changes all the times with the events you gotta they talk have. About oh. it changes all the time with the events they have I think there's four or five there now I, I'm okay. not positive you can okay. see uh, per okay. per yeah. season they change we, we, yeah we're always changing the field so I really can't say specifically how many there are because they change very often okay thanks and what would with JFK offline, you you met, you lost one decent sized field, and then there, I know there was a bunch of fields in the middle of what they used to do in the middle. But. Yeah, they have um, JFK. We have the eleven v eleven, and then right. the nine v nine, and a right. field hockey. Yep. For for JFK. Right. Boe. Yep. 
So, Mr. Mayor, we wanted to do this so visually. I thought it would be easier for people to understand what, what resources we have, um, you know, the fact that they're used seven days a week. And there have been meetings. Uh, one group is not satisfied. They're here to voice that. I wanted to do this because we can't go back and forth when you come up to give public communication. We can't answer you. So if we give this as a primer so the council understands what we have um, and then everybody can speak and make their piece. I'm going to direct. I know there was a request again for another meeting, so I'm going to direct that they meet again and we're going to try to work it out. What I wanted the council to know and the public to know is that because we have a, a, a field use policy that's first come first serve, serve basis, there's no provision in it to knock people out and take it away on a non-voluntary basis. I don't have that authority. So I want the council to look at the policy because I think going forward it needs to be revised. I think there really has to be a field advisory policy to look at all the fields for all the sports and in a more equitable manner distribute them for use during the season. It's tough to do it now. The season's underway and people get very frustrated. So I want you to know we're working on it and we are trying to find more fields and locations to have a complex so in the future not only will we be able to address our internal but actually perhaps make uh, you know some revenue for the town by providing it for other towns uh, in the state as well so I thank these gentlemen and I, I don't want to delay it any further I know that there are people anxious to speak thank you very much appreciate you both you good mayor yep thank you good job okay so now we appreciate it uh, we now move on to item seven which is public communication so ground rules for folks you have to be an Enfield resident to speak your name and address when you come up you have five minutes to speak you're allowed twice if we can fit in with an hour um, so it's eight o'clock so we have an hour depending on how many people want to speak we, so we're going to allow everyone to at least speak once before we go to a second time so everyone gets a chance to who wants to speak again name and address we ask you to please refrain from personalities and again anyone like to speak for the council Sir. And just, just click on a red button when you're ready to. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Rousseau, and I live at 12 Bellwood Drive in Enfield. Uh, I'm here to speak about the allocation of athletic fields in town, uh, specifically the uh, soccer fields. Uh, as you know, there's two soccer organizations in town. I am privileged to serve as the elected president of the Enfield Soccer Association. We were established in the fall of 2019, and because of COVID, we didn't get onto the fields until last summer. We provide instructional, recreational, academy, competitive, and high school soccer programs. Last year, we started with 20 children. We're up to 700 children that play for the Enfield Soccer Association. That's just one year, 700 kids that play for us in town. Growing from 20 children to 700 in about a year speaks volumes. There's obviously an appetite in the town for our programs with our philosophy and our vision. It's certainly resonating with the town folks. I really shouldn't be here in front of you right now. It never should have gotten to this point, never. I should not be in front of you right now. I believe I've made good faith efforts in trying to work with the town in order to obtain needed field space for our organization, our kids. In my judgment, the town has not been, the town has been unwilling to find solutions for us in the last year. The town has not been able to accommodate our actual needs. I've made numerous requests for additional field space, but I've been denied. To your point, Mr. Town Manager, you said first come, first serve. I know I put my request in for the fields on January 1st at 4.34 a.m. So if someone beat me to the punch, I guess I'm going to have to FOI those records because I put my request in at January 1st, 4.34 a.m., including two fields at Shaker, the 7v7 and 9v9. I'll wait for that request, and I look forward to seeing that information. I've made meeting requests. They've not been acknowledged. I've offered my own solutions, but have been ignored. We have teams that don't have fields to practice on right now. These kids right back here, these three kids, they don't have a field this year. I don't have a field to give them. They try to find extra space wherever they can. They're like nomads. It's not fair to them. Oftentimes they find themselves in baseball fields, hoping that there's no little leaguers that have home run power that night. 
Just on our recreational side alone, that little small space, that postage stamp behind Nathan Hale, we have 20 recreational teams. They do all their practices and all their games in that area. I even had to make some of the recreational fields smaller just to squeeze everything in. Smaller fields with kids stumbling over each other takes away from the experience that these kids deserve. Not to mention, you'd be hard to find a blade of grass, an actual piece of grass on those Nathan Hale fields. All dirt, some weeds. After the games, our kids look like pig pen from the peanuts. Good thing we didn't do white jerseys this year. I keep asking for more field space, but town tells me they don't have any more to offer. Meanwhile, myself and other people in the know realize there's a lot of unused field space at the town's Shaker Field Complex. There are seven soccer fields over there that are the best soccer fields in town, real grass. I must have driven by Shaker 10 times this spring. Each and every time, there are only a couple fields in use. The majority of the seven fields aren't being used. My observations have also been affirmed by many others. It's no secret there wasn't much soccer going on at Shaker last fall. And there's even less soccer going on at Shaker this spring. Months ago, when the town told me that they don't have any space to give us, because I was trying to get more fields in the spring, I pointed out that the seven fields at Shaker are rarely used. I was told by Buildings and Grounds that the town cannot give Enfield Soccer Association any space over at Shaker. I asked why not. There was no answer given to me. I was told I have to go up the chain. Keep in mind all my previous requests and field applications over the last year for Shaker have been denied. It appears that there is an order from above that came above buildings and grounds to prevent us from being given any space at Shaker. Who is giving this order? Why is this order being given? Is there someone running interference behind the scenes? These are questions I would implore our counselors to ask and get answers to. Every seconds, one of 30 you. Seconds, sorry. Either way, the town had ample opportunity to help these kids this spring and failed miserably. It makes me sick to my stomach that these kids aren't being put first. Recently, after going up the chain and begging for more space, our children, uh, the town gave us one of seven fields at Shaker, just one field. And we only have that field on Monday and Fridays. No Saturday or Sunday weekend events. It's a step in the right direction, but ultimately it's more symbolic than anything. When you take a look at the total unused space available in those seven fields, and balanced with our access to just one field for a couple hours a week, in reality, the town gave us about 5% a shaker. That's it, 5%. Sir, your time's up. You can have, sorry, you're gonna have to come back. Five minutes. I'll be back. Yeah. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Name and address, please. Hi. It, 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 it was on. Yeah. Jeff Gentis, 37 Cottage Road. Uh, I'm here on the Infield Soccer Association as well. I'm coming right from the field, so I apologize for my dress. Um, I'm here on, on two capacities. One, I'm a parent of the uh, of a player on the U11 boys team. That Twain field on the upper right-hand corner that we were discussing before, when teams come from other towns and their parents come, they don't think they're playing Enfield Soccer Association. They think they were playing Enfield. And I would suggest you go to the field that borders Beach Road and just take a look at it and think, is this what we want to be putting out there to area towns? Is this what Enfield is about? Is this what we want to have be the face of Enfield be um, a dust bowl uh, or the desert, which is what the kids on the team were calling it. Uh, second is I am a coach in the UA girls team. I am one of the teams that has been looking for space. We were on a quarter of that Twain two field uh, for the first part of the year. Then we got onto Fermi in this space that's not well maintained, that's not lined. Um, you know, we've, we've got cones. We're trying to now we're dodging um, the JV baseball team. We've had to move again. Um, we just need some space, and I, I don't. Um, I, I don't know if it's you know if it's the field use policy. I don't know if it's negligence. I don't know if it's something worse. We just need it fixed for the fall. So whatever you can do, we'd appreciate it. Um, and I can also be uh, as a resident of Shaker Pines. I can also attest to the fact that the Shaker fields are just simply not being used uh, in anywhere near uh, their availability and their capacity. Um, I typically see perhaps a couple of the small. Um, 4v4 fields in the back being used. Occasionally you might see one of the uh, 7v7s being used, but the demand's just not there anymore. Um, and, and a lot of the, the new associations brought a lot of new players to the forefront, but it's also just caused a huge shift. 
and um, and I realize it's been sudden and that people may not know that Enfield Soccer Association uh, is around, but those numbers are real uh, and we have the demand and whatever it takes. Uh, uh, and I appreciate you giving the background um, at the beginning of the presentation, but whatever it takes, we just need it fixed for the fall. It's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, uh, privilege of the floor as manager. What I'm going to do normally, I could respond to this under the manager report because we can't go back and forth. Um, but what I would like to do is when they have concluded under my report, I'm going to ask Donald and Mark to come up to specifically address the issue of the non-use of Shaker. Because I want you to know there's no conspiracy. If there's anybody above the Public Works Department, it's me. And the first I heard of this is with um, Mr. Rousseau's email. I said, meet and see what you can work out. It came back to me that all the fields are being used. They've been assigned. So if that's not so, we're going to find out in five minutes. Because the only one who could overrule them is me. No one else from the council has been involved. No one other in town government has been involved. And I've told them I want the truth. And I, I've trust their judgment in the past in regard to fields. But we're going to ask them under my report so you can all get an answer. What is the use of Shaker and is there availability? Because I'm telling you right now, the answer to me is they've been given out in the, in the normal routine and it's not available. So we'll wait and see in about five minutes when you're all done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Welcome. Um, hello. My name is Trish Larice. I live at 128 Willard Drive in Enfield. Um, my family's been part of Enfield Soccer for about a decade now. Oh, sorry. Um, Welcome. Trish go right ahead. Yep, go right ahead. Sorry. 128 yeah. Willard Drive. Sorry about that. Um, my family's been part of Enfield Soccer for about 10 years now. Um, I used to be. On. Our family was part of ESC. I was a team manager. I was part of board of directors, um, but made the decision to transfer over to Enfield Soccer Association because they were not meeting our needs and then some. Um, I understand policies have been in place for a long time, but times have changed. Um, the club may be, the Enfield Soccer Club may have been the club that was the original and has been here, but three quarters of that organization walked because they didn't do what they needed to do for our children. This isn't about politics. It's not about people puffing out their chest. ESA's number one is the well-being and the development of our children. And in my opinion, with a decade worth of experience, that was not the case with the other organization, which is why three quarters of this soccer organization jumped and went to ESA. They've done an amazing job. They've provided a positive atmosphere. Our children have thrived. They've developed. And to have to, as a taxpayer, our, my child may not have space to play the game that he loves because there's a club <laughs> that is not as relevant as they used to be, claiming those fields is ridiculous. We are outraged and we will not stop until Enfield Soccer Association gets the fields that they need. They deserve it. It's about the kids and that's it. So this, I know old policies and you have to look into things, but times have changed. We need some new ones and that's why we're all here. It's about our, our kids. So that's what I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And would also like to speak for the council. Paul. Welcome. Name and address, please. Good evening. Paul Coffey, 16 Montana Road. I've been a lifelong resident. Um, I want to thank uh, Mark and Donald for being here. Mr. Bromson, uh, thanks for the preemptive comments. Uh, you stole a lot of my thunder uh, that I was working on today. Um, but I do want to let everyone know that um, part of um, the Loan Review Committee, I'm the Vice Chairman uh, for Loan Review Committee, working with the OCD, Office of Community Development. Um, very important uh, for the town of Enfield. Uh, I'd like to recognize um, the whole OCD staff, including Christy and Nelson, for the work they do. They're very dedicated and diligent. Um, they secure a lot of the federal and state funding for uh, CDBG, um, which is used for some of the great programs the town of Enfield runs, including a first-time home buyer program and also housing uh, housing rehab as well. So I just want to uh, you know say thank you there. Um, more importantly, I'm here for um, the Enfield Soccer Association. I want to speak on their behalf. Uh, I'm the former treasurer of the organization. I've also handled um, the applications for both the field use and also the exemptions for the field use. Um, so I'm acutely aware of the process and, and uh, 
and trying to secure the fields was very difficult for the last year. No offense against Mark Gar and his staff and then Donald Nunez, but it's been very trying to get these kids on playing surfaces. The, um, the lack of uh, fields and green space obviously has been an issue in the town of Enfield for, for well over 20 years. We've documented in surveys and that we've had for many years. Um, it's great to see the three R's, the DPW doing the three R's, um, the roads and, and the recreation, very important. It's nice to see a really positive step in the right direction. Um, however, I think that the Department of Buildings and Grounds has not provided adequate quantity and quality of soccer fields for this organization. The fields, Mark Twain 2, in the upper right-hand corner you saw, was brown in that picture. It is brown. It, the field is deplorable. It needs to be fixed. And this is before even the fall starts. That's just one of the field issues. Um, I'm not sure, I hate to be pointed about it, but I'm not sure if DPW and Buildings and Grounds have the necessary resources to adequately provide fields for ESA. Hence, we are here to appeal to the town council. Um, and it sounds like you already started to address this issue, but I don't want any you know, chest puffing. I want this to get done, okay? Um, without the fields at JFK Middle School, obviously we know that's under construction. That also puts the town in a, a bad spot, losing those fields. Never mind the three field soccer fields that were at um, as Nuntuck previously. Um, so we do have some options long-term. If you guys can put your heads together and think about some long-term plans, I'm sure you guys have already discussed it, but you have asked Nuntuck. I know there's level, level ground there. Um, you have other areas that you can open up to, I think, if for long haul. But for the interim, for the short time frame, we're gonna need some fields for the fall, and that's the reason why we're here. Um, there are fields available at Shaker. The Shaker soccer complex is not being fully utilized. So for the fall, we'd like to have uh, a reasonable um, allocation of the field. And first time, you know, I've always been told that it's first come, first serve. And when I, you know, was a treasurer for the soccer, for softball, I did the same thing. Four o'clock in the morning, I sent an email to Mark Gar, let him know we're going to need the field for, for softball. We've done that same thing for here for soccer, but we didn't, we didn't get preference for any of the fields. So there's, that's one thing I wanted to find out. Um, we have not been given that information what the preference is. So this is very nice to hear that you come forward with that. Um, so I'm simply asking for the resources. You give the resources to buildings and grounds to make it equitable and do right for this organization. As you know, the town council's priorities, goals, and objectives are economic development, education, infrastructure, public safety, and last but not least, is quality of life. Per the town website, it states quality of life includes enhancing recreational opportunities. That has not been done. For the 520 Enfield households that belong to the ESA, this recre recreational opportunity is not being enhanced by any means. The 520 Enfield families and 600 children are our future leaders, by the way, are not being given that quality of life. These 520 families contribute roughly $3.1 million in property taxes, motor vehicles, and sewer use taxes as well um, to the Enfield coffers. $3.1 million. That's significant. All they're looking for is a patch of grass to play soccer on. Now, Ten, I, I, ten seconds, sorry. Yep. 10 seconds, sorry. I didn't give you a 30 second round. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Anyone else like to speak for the council? Uh, sir, then Murray. I'm gonna hand this out to you. And I'll ask you guys to pass it down. It may not be enough, but this is close to my speaking. Uh, my name's, okay. My name is Timothy Griscus, 46 Varnell Lane in town. I've been a lifelong resident of Enfield. I grew up here. I grew up on the other side of town. I am the registrar for the Enfield Soccer Association, so I have firsthand knowledge of our numbers, how often I get emails. My phone is constantly on me, and I probably do more work for this nonprofit than I do for my normal job. What you'll see here is Enfield Soccer Club feels that they own Shaker Field. They are promoting it as the Enfield Soccer Club's Shaker Field Complex. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a town taxpayer. That's 
I can play on that field. The other hashtag they put is one town, one club. Why would you, my, my question is, why would you promote that to your town's people? Our feeling in the Enfield Soccer Association is the more kids that have a soccer ball at their feet, the better. We are 40,000 people in this town. We have 700 kids, almost 700 kids, signed up for our organization in less than a year. What does that tell you about the, the type of services that they have been provided previously? We have all the boys' competitive teams. They were with Enfield Soccer Club. They came to us. I get constant emails. I reply to my email within an hour. I get constant emails. Oh my God, I've, just thank you for your quick reply. I had people last year email us and ask, can I have a refund for my spring fees and my fall fees? I never got a refund. I've sent you three, four emails, never got a refund. Enfield Soccer Club, unfortunately, does not reply to their emails. What people want is people want to be heard, people want to be acknowledged, and people want service. As a nonprofit, my, I have a daughter, she's 11 years old, she's been playing soccer since four years old. She's played for the Enfield Soccer Club. There's a lot of good people in that club. Ken Boulay is a great coach, my daughter played with him. Sal is a great coach, I have no problem with them. We have no problem with the Enfield Soccer Club. Our problem is we do not feel that we are getting the proper adequate space for the numbers that we have. I drive by Shaker, there is nobody playing on weeknights, maybe the, exactly how everybody else said, the 4v4 fields, maybe the 7v7 fields. We could be allocated a 9v9 field for our teams to play on, and we have no problem with sharing those fields. Example, I don't even think Enfield Soccer Club is aware that we were given the 11v11 field. We practiced there tonight. Bill Foote, who is one of their board members, came up to me and asked me what we were doing there. I told him, we have an email from Donald Nunes that has allocated us this field on Monday and Fridays. We're practicing here so that our children do not have to dodge baseballs at the annex. He looked at me and said, well, we have an event here tonight. And I said, okay, there's plenty of other field space. Nothing else was being used. He looked at me again and said, we have our event here tonight. I then said, well, I have a copy of the email if you'd like to see it. I handed the email to him and I said, we will be practicing here tonight. If there is an issue, please contact Donald. They were not aware that we were given this field space. And that email, that social media post shows that they were not aware. All I'm asking for is our children to be put on the fields at Shaker. It's the best fields in town. And a lot of those kids that are in our organization now have played there before. They ask us, why can't we play at Shaker? Why can't we do this? Jeff emailed 4.30 a.m. He texted me at 4.30 to let me know the email had been sent. We requested these fields. That's all I have to say. We want to be given our fair shake. Now I know that Ken Boulay is an employee of the town. Ken does all the field work for Enfield Soccer Club. That's why I think that nobody on their board was aware that we were given those fields. All I'm asking for is, again, field space. There should be no reason why we cannot share those fields. If you need adequate numbers, we can give you a contact at the Connecticut Junior Soccer Association for actual registered children. Pull it from Enfield Soccer Club, pull it from Enfield Soccer Association. You will see a big discrepancy, very big discrepancy. People were not happy with the Enfield Soccer Club. Again, my kids had great time when they were with them. Things need to move. The other thing I wanna add is, 30 we, seconds. We are, an we are combined with the high school coaches, the middle school coaches. They are part of our organization. We are working with them to feed our high school programs. Enfield Soccer Club never did that. They say they did, but the coaches have said, nobody contacted us. They're part of our organization now. They are helping teach our kids. That's all I have to say. We just want our field space, and we, will, we have no problem with sharing it with them. We're all adults. Thank you. Thank you. Marie Pisner, 25 Roy Street. I had no idea that there was going to be so many young families here tonight, but I am so happy to see them. I am here to show my support for the referendum. Um, it is so important for our town to maintain our school buildings, our roofs, 
the most important asset we have as a town is to maintain our education for these parents and kids that are sitting behind us. And the second thing is recreation. And it's exactly what these parents are saying. We need the parks, not just for kids, but the parks that are gonna be in this referendum are going to enhance our whole town for every age. And finally, our roads. They need to continue to be fixed. They need to be continue to be safe. So I am encouraging anyone at home that is watching tonight to start understanding what this referendum is going to do for our town and how important it is for our young families, our older folks. We need this. So next week we'll hear more about it, but I am here to encourage people, the residents of Enfield, to get on board because I love seeing this young, these young families here. When my kids were young, I fought for the good schools, I fought for the sports, and I'm so encouraged to see these families behind me tonight doing the same thing for their kids. They are the future of our town. So please, everybody at home, get on board, find out about the referendum, and help it to push through. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else like to speak for the council? Welcome. Name and address, please. And if the uh, light, make sure the light's on. The light's on, yeah. Uh, Dave Morrow, 57 Spruce Wind Road. Can I pull this down so it doesn't sound muffled? Yeah. All right. Uh, I am the, uh, the head coach of the U11 boys travel team. I also have a daughter on the uh, U8 academy team. Um, I'll make it quick because a lot was said behind me and it was a lot of what I was going to say. But uh, from my perspective, I think all we're asking for is just fair share for the kids. Because when it comes down to it, this is all about the kids. I did coach for ESC as well. I don't have anything bad to say. Um, I'm not going to do that today. But uh, the field space should be equal. Um, I do have friends that coach in other towns, and uh, they have had similar situations where a new club came in, and they went in front of the council, and they said, it's about the kids, and it should be fair share across the board. Um, I wouldn't even call Mark Twain a soccer field. Um, what Jeff said earlier, I, I think rings true, that if we're going to have any matches here, and we're bringing people in from other towns, and we're showing them that this is what Enfield is, that is not a good look. And I don't think it's a good look for the town to show them that. It's, it's, it is a dust bowl. Um, there's, it, it looks like potholes. Um, you kick the ball. The ball could hit a giant patch of dirt and bounce to the side. Um, I think that that should be uh, a field looked at. Um, I have not personally been over to Nathan Hale, but I have heard that it is also basically unusable. Uh, I live right down the street from uh, Shaker Field. And I can attest to the fact that uh, I, I come home at 5, 6 o'clock from work, typically, and I don't really see many teams out there. So if you're being told that uh, all seven fields are filled, um, you can take my word for it that uh, they are not filled. Um, I do see one, maybe two teams, and there's plenty of room for us. And that's the thing. I, I think that if there was a third club in, in the town, that that's fine. The more the merrier. The more kids get, getting out there and playing youth sports instead of sitting at home on their electronics, I think is very, very important. And we have to get these kids out there. Just give us the fair share. That's all we're asking. So we can, you know, we can coexist. Just split them up. And if Fermi becomes available as well, uh, I know the Ramblers will be playing there. But if there's even open space there, that would be that would be Keith. Those are two beautiful fields, and I think it's a great representation of our town. If we're bringing in, uh, you know, other teams from Canton and Hartford, so they can see these beautiful facilities that we have, not Mark Twain. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Yeah. Welcome. Name and address, please. Hi, Stacy Volk, 69 Willard Drive. I am a parent of an ESA player, formerly ESC, um, and I'm also a team manager. And what I can see, just from my perspective, is that we are not getting the fair share of what we need. 
these kids are playing at Mark Twain, like they said already. We started the season in Mark Twain. We had a little tiny piece of it, and there was def there was six teams trying to share one field. We went over to the annex, which is wonderful. We love it there. But now that's being taken away from us also. So come fall, we lose our 9v9 field at the annex, plus we lose our turf field. And they're giving a shaker field instead, just Mondays and Fridays. That's it. Where do we play our games on the weekends? What it looks like from us is that we are not getting our fair share. ESC was the original club in town, and we are secondary to them. Again, just from what we see. And we just want our fair share. Just give us the fields, let our kids get out there and play. And that's all we're asking for. I don't think it's much as taxpayers of this town. We deserve to have these kids play on these fields. And that's all. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Anyone else like to speak for the council? For the first time, going once. Going once. All right. Uh, anyone for the second time? You have three minutes for the second time, sir? Almost done. <laughs> for people that know me, I could probably take a half hour, but I'll save he you. Talks a lot. If you wait three more hours, you can go at the end of the meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I'd like to get some sleep tonight. Sorry. Just proceed your name and address for the record again. You have three minutes. That's Jeff Russo, 12 Bellwood Drive, Enfield. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. So we're kind of where I left off, uh, the town for the fall did give us one soccer field out of the seven at Shaker, the 11, the 11 field, uh, for Mondays and Fridays only. That amounts to uh, about 5%, maybe less of the whole complex when you consider the weekend times and all the other times. In the fall, with it being dark so early, that's like, what, an hour and 15 minutes each day? That's just not gonna do it. I mean, we need probably about 50% of those Shaker fields in order to accommodate all these 700 kids. Right now, what I have for the field allotment is about enough for 350, maybe half. And we're growing, and we have more programs and more teams coming. We have more kids playing soccer. We've done free programs, recruited sponsors. We get more kids playing soccer in Enfield than ever before, I think, at least since I've been here the last 13 years. So I don't know what, who's doing the homework or where the numbers are coming from or where you're getting this information, um, but you know, a lot of our members feel it's a slap in the face. It's a symbolic gesture to give us 5% on Monday through Friday. If anything, the one day of the week that teams take off, the day before the weekend, is Friday. All right, if anything, they take off Friday. Interestingly enough, we went to our one field at Shaker this past Friday, and guess how many uh, other teams were at Shaker besides us? Guess how many? Seven fields over there. We were the only team that was at Shaker on our one field. The other six fields vacant, empty. Pretty much what we've been telling you all night, empty. I think everyone needs to do their homework. Two soccer organizations, equal rights and privileges, two nonprofits, both CGSA and U.S. Soccer affiliated and recognized. I would think the town would allocate fields based on actual needs, actual needs. We have approximately triple the amount than the other soccer club, yet we have less space. How is it that we have less space? Does that make any sense to anyone? As other speakers mentioned, definitely, definitely is not an equitable allotment and distribution of fields. If anything, you got the other club promoting Shaker Field, multiple posts on Facebook, videos. Check them out. They're exploiting the issue. They're exploiting the situation. They're laughing at everyone because they're not doing their homework. It's shameful. I will continue to advocate for our kids and their Enfield families. Our kids deserve better. Who in this room is willing to step up and do the right thing by these kids? I know I am. 30 seconds. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council for the second time? For the second time. Anyone else, one last chance for the first time? I'll, I'll speak for the second time really quick. You have three minutes, okay. I can get everything out. So Tim Griskis, 46 Varnell Lane. The one other thing I want to say is that the entire time, I do all of our social media and all of our marketing, the entire time since we started this organization, we have taken the high road. We could have thrown all the dirt and all the reasoning why we left Enfield Soccer Club out there for the town and the public to see. 
It's not, it, 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 it's not about that. Right. We don't recommend it here. Please. Right. right. And I'm not going to. Yeah. My first hashtag on all of our posts is it's about the kids. Always. I will never disparage the other club. I have never said a bad word about the other club. What they did when we first started and got our organization approved, they, they, they just went off. And they, they made our president, who is a Hartford police officer, they made, they put lies on the, on the internet, things that could affect his career, which were not true. So I just want to say we have continued to take the high road, yet we have continued to be beat down on social media by another club that is just not happy that there is another organization in town. I know clubs, I know towns all over Connecticut, towns that have three, four clubs that are all nonprofits. They work together to make sure that kids, and we have sent kids to Enfield Soccer Club because we do not have a program for them. I've, I can show you email after email of, please contact this person. They have a team for you. We want your kid to play. Again, it's all about the kids for me. It always will be. And that's, and that's really what our whole organization is about. We have a free program for kids that are three to five years old, free. They don't have to pay a dime. They get a t-shirt, they come out, they play soccer on Saturday mornings. It's a great chance for parents that don't have a lot of money to come out and see if their kid likes soccer. If their kid loves soccer, he could be, he could, he could make that into a career where he has a scholarship for college. But there's a lot of folks in town that don't have $120 to dish out to try soccer. That's why we did our free program. Learn to play, it's on Saturday mornings. We had 275 kids in the spring before it got canceled. We had 280 this past spring and we had an 85% return show up. 85% of those 280 kids came out. The fields were packed at the annex. It was great to see. 30 seconds. That's all I gotta say. It's about, it's about the kids for us and we just really want to make sure that they have adequate field space to play because they have a blast, I can tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Yep, you too. Anyone else like to speak for the second time? Anyone else? Okay, declare public communications closed. We move on to item nine on the, excuse me, item eight, council communications. Any councilor have any communications? Councilor Bosco and Councilor Hemler. Okay, I, I wanna start out with, first off, I know nothing about soccer. I am probably the most unsportsy person there is. So it's actually sort of good for you. But there's a couple things that you guys have to understand. And I almost take offense, not terribly, but our staff works very hard to keep these fields as in good a condition as we possibly can. So if you think about it, it's like walking to your shed every day. You end up getting that grass that dies. So our fields are used so much that they really don't have time to rejuvenate. Well, no, I mean, that, that, that's it. Walk on your lawn and see what happens to your grass. It's going to die. So the problem is they do. And, and we've, we've had this with the baseball fields and all that. They, they run so many. You, know, you, you take a look at them fields. They're being used every day. From five to nine, you're going to wear the grass out. So it's just there's nothing you can do with that, and uh, that that's that's it. But with what you're saying is everyone should have an equal chance at these fields. We are going to be looking at this, start looking at this at our next DBW uh, subcommittee. Um, the the one of the problems could be is the other soccer team may have thought they were going to have this many kids and because yours is gained so much that no one expected uh, there could be fields that they said they need it and they really don't so you know what what I'd like to know for our meeting is really what is going on if they really aren't using these fields then we need to figure out I don't know what we really could do because we sort of have a contract with the other soccer team for these fields, and, but it's not fair if they're not using them that they don't get used by someone else. 
So we'll uh, we'll know in about five minutes. Yeah, and then we'll, we get the rest of the information. Just make sure we have every, whatever we need for the uh, DPW committee, because everyone should be able to have use of the fields if they need it. And then, like you said, we need I think to figure out a fairer way to to do this. And it may be that you have to get your roster in and go by percentage. I mean, we only have so many fields. We can't create any more fields. So you know if one soccer team has 80% of the kids and the other one's got 20. Well, the one with 80 should get 80, uh, you know, should get the bigger share of the fields. The problem is when you have such an increase over a year, like you said, nobody, especially the town, we, we, we don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden you find out that, oh, yeah, no, there's 300 more kids that need a spot to play we only have so much spot especially closing up jfk so uh we'll get that information and we're going to try to figure out at least for next year and hopefully we can do something this year but a more equitable way of uh a lot in the fields and it may just mean that everyone needs to put their name in and at a certain date they're going to be allotted and, and, and that should be it. I mean, I, I don't know what else, but I could just tell you we're, we'll look at it and you didn't fall on deaf ears and we'll try to do what we can do with the perimeters that we're stuck with. Thank you. Oh, also, uh, I happened to go down the bike path and we got some big cracking in there that we're going to need some uh, sealing uh, of the cracks. I mean, there was I seen one. It was probably about almost an inch wide. Our our bag path on Town Farm Road, so you know I don't want to I don't want to lose that bike path, and then uh, I was told talked to by a resident, um, it was on a dial a ride. I guess he was told we're having a hard time finding drivers for dial a ride. So his idea was, um, you know, I guess nowadays we're using you know not us but the the other people are using. Uh, like zip recruiter or something like that so he wanted me to just bring it up that maybe we should be looking at one of them search things to try to get some help because uh, we know there's there's no help out there so um, you know other than just going to the town website to find it post it somewhere else that's it Um, to all the residents here um, to speak, I, I really love to see the passion, and especially for your, for all your kids. And I 100% agree that sports is the best thing that kids can do. You know, I have two two kids, and I always pushed it, even though I'm not much of an athlete myself. But I know the value in that. So uh, I know we'll come up with with something. I mean, I wasn't aware of this, so we'll we'll figure something out. Um, the Veterans Council, uh, when I went to the meeting, they said that they wanted me to say that they really, really thank the town staff. Even though um, the um, Memorial Day Parade didn't happen, they've, uh, they've always gotten a lot of help from the town staff, and they're very appreciative. Um, Joe Muller and I went to the Blue Line training at the uh, at the police department. We were also given a, uh, a tour, and uh, wow, that's all I have to say is just wow. I mean, it's really valuable training and uh, well worth the money that we've spent on it uh, for the for the uh, officers. And we got a. Um, we were there for what, a couple hours. Well, yeah, <laughs> got a got a tour of the whole station, and it was just it was very very interesting. Um, our farmers market, and I know other councilors to talk about this as well. Was uh, the first one was this Sunday. Um, great job, and I'm really looking forward to building on it. A um, lot of people there, and uh, for all the parents that are here, if you didn't go to the farmers market, you really should. It's free ice cream. So can't go wrong there. Um, I got a lot of great vegetables. There's a lot of um, a lot of crafts and stuff too. So in music, so it was very fun. And um, oh, because the because the um, parade was canceled, I had asked the fourth celebration organization if we could do a Fourth of July uh, parade, and they said yes. 
So um, I th uh, we have to wait for the details. They're working it out, but we're going to have a parade. So that's really exciting. And I think that's all I had. Yes, thank you. I think Kelly stole most of mine, but really good. The 4th of July parade will be Saturday, July 3rd, and we're thinking around 11 a.m., but we have our first meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m., so that's a really good time. Uh, Friday night, uh, several of us attended the Toast of the Town fundraising event for ERFC. It was a really good time. The food was excellent. Uh, it was at Twin Hills. It was great to see uh, Chris Dresick MC the event. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Councilor Mangini, then Councilor. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, Kelly uh, Hemler just uh, pointed out the blue line training, which I did have the opportunity to experience, and it was very um, educational because what it what it did was it showed how quick our police officers must respond in any situation, life and death situations, and it was really eye opening to experience that. Um, I do want to mention Mr. or actually Counselor Bob Crisati is not <clears throat> present this evening because he his team um, won the championship. So he's at his championship game tonight. And congratulations to Bob Crisati for that. That's hard work. Anyone dealing with children uh, coaching and refing, I, I know I did my, my soccer coaching and refing years ago. Um, which brings me to my next point. You know, these are our, our children, and we are one community, and it, it really is very important that we, as a community, come together and, and bring the clubs together. I'd love to see that communication, and I know the town uh, will do what, uh, you know, can be done, um, because there should not be um, the adversary positions between the clubs. These are children. These are our children. And, and they all want to be out there kicking the ball and picking the dandelions. I, I know. i got two of them in soccer right now, grandchildren. And it really needs to be a situation where the adults, you know, we all work together and, and make this right for the kids. Because they're, they're what it's all about, the kids. Not the adults, it's the kids. So I, I have to say that. I'm for the kids. Okay. Um, Enfield Food Shelf is having a vaccine clinic uh, tomorrow from 2 to 5 at their facility. All are welcome to attend. And um, I know Joe uh, mentioned the ERFC fundraiser. That was a phenomenal event. And congratulations to ERFC um, for anyone who may not be aware, educational resources for children uh, depends upon their fundraising to help offset the costs and in some cases pay for some children that are unable to attend summer camp or get after school services. It's just a phenomenal um, program and it was so well attended and everyone had a great time. So I just want to mention that. Thank you. Okay, um, so we all got forwarded uh, an email from uh, Enfield Soccer Association. So I'd like to ask that that gets put into the public record. Um, then my other thing is I'm not a soccer parent. I have two little kids that don't play soccer, so I have zero idea how this all works. I've filled out building use forms for Cub Scouts and First Readers. Um, so I don't know if when you have to fill the forms out, if it's like I'm asking for X, Y, and these specific fields, or if it's just I need nine of this and four of this or, or whatever. But my question would be eventually, if we have two associations, well, club associations in town, and they're asking for X amount of fields, and I, they're asking it for it to be equitable, because it in numbers from what we got it looked like you have the same amount of fields it's just that the quality of the fields that you have are not up to the shaker fields now i live right by shaker i live right um in shaker pines lake so i go right by all the time they're beautiful i've i didn't even know <laughs> that those were soccer fields behind mark twain i just knew that the baseball fields were there um so i'm wondering if maybe they can be distributed well and i don't know how this works with soccer scheduling and stuff but like so give 
half of Mark Twain to each of them. Give half of Shaker Pines Shaker to each of them. You know, split them up that way instead of the majority here and the majority there. If they would work, that they just get half of what we got equally. Um, so that's my comments on the whole soccer thing. But I appreciate. I'm glad you guys came because. I have no idea that this was even happening. So I'm glad that you came, because that's what we need people to do. And we don't know it, and you come, that's great. Um, then the other thing I wanted to bring up was the Blue Line trailer I went to. I spent like three and a half hours at the police department. And let me tell you, if I was a 10-year-old, I would have been like on high for like weeks on end. And I think I probably still am, because it was, it was a great time. And what our police officers do is no joke. Like. The situations that I saw in the trailer were things that you would never think of, but it happens. Um, so those guys, the police department is doing a phenomenal job, and I wanted to thank them for letting me come. Um, and then the last thing is I just wanted to talk about um, our first reader's ceremony that we had. It was on the 24th of May. It was at us and it And it was, it was awesome. Um, so in town, we certified 291 new first readers through all three schools. 161 people drove their cars through us Nuntuck to pick up their um, certificates and everything. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to a few people. Um, some of the counselors, um, Lori came and Bob Crisati came. Um, a couple of BOE members, Walter and Jonathan LeBlanc came. Um, most of the children's department from the library came. Um, people from Kite, people from ERFC. Um, say it with love cards. They put up a big sign for us at Nuntuck. Um, and I wanted to thank the Enfield Teachers Association for the books. Um, so it was awesome. And another thing about books is I, I got re I had an email just the other day, um, and I, this is how cool our town is. The Enfield Culture and Arts Commission sent me an email and asked if I would like to receive a grant for $500 for books for our kids. And so I was like, yes, let's do it. So I'm happy to say that we didn't get to have our one fundraiser that buys all of the shirts, the books, the pens, the pencils, the certificates and medals. We didn't get to have it this year, so we're going to be, you know, crunching for supplies, but thanks to the Enfield Culture and Arts Commission for the grant. And that was it. The solid council of the council on guard. I, I'm, I was next. Oh, you're next, yeah, council right? Okay. All right. I want to thank you all for coming out and expressing your, your passion and your concerns. I can certainly feel what you're saying. Um, I know sp how important sports are. I know I probably don't look like it now at my age, but back in the day, I played 10 years women's softball, and I loved it, and it was here in town. So uh, I know how important that is. And um, I remember seeing some emails, and I'm hoping uh, by bringing this, m giving it future light that we can reschedule um, and be fair to everybody. So thank you. And we, we hear what you're saying. Um, I'd like to congratulate all the first readers that got their certificates. I'll tell you, uh, Councilor Riley did an amazing job. She makes it look easy. And, and through COVID and all the cars and all the planning and the stops, I just showed up and smiled and waved and directed cars. And, and she did all the hard work. So congratulations to all the first readers and all your hard work. It was amazing. I also attended the adult the adult ed graduation. There were 18 graduates this year, and um, you could see the, the proudness in their faces and their parents when they um, had their caps and gowns on, and that's really a wonderful, great achievement for them. So congratulations to all of them. I also attended the Blue Line trailer uh, training, and that was really eye-opening, and also toured the police station again. and. Um, we have such a great team over there, and uh, it was great to spend time with them, and I learned a lot. I also attended the ERFC, that banquet, and I want to congratulate Claire Hall for all her years of giving to the town of Enfield, and it was really a nice send-off for her. So congratulations all around. Councilor Sakala, sorry. Thanks. I'll, I'll try to be quick. I don't want to belabor the point. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Um, Thank you. 
we understand your passion. If anybody's going to get really passionate about some sports stuff up here, it's probably going to be me, so I get it. Um, but you please also understand that I'm a sports parent. I spend 90% of my weekends on a sport field. So, but I can probably say that most people up here didn't have any idea that there was more than one soccer association or club until the last week or two. Maybe they did, but we probably didn't know a lot of this was going on, so we understand your passion. But now that we know, we are going to try to do what we can. While we do what we can, we will still encourage you to keep those lines of communications open with the other association, see what you guys can do internally while we do what we need to do on this side. Um, I do not envy Buildings and Grounds job. They have a thousand fields to do with. They have parents like me probably talking to them all the time about field conditions. Um, they have to deal with high school sports, not having a middle school. They have to deal with COVID. They have to deal with out of town people coming in and using our fields that are unauthorized. They have a lot of stuff to deal with. So we all have to just sort of understand that there is a lot of working parts. I think everybody up here, including the town, wants you to have your equitable share. Equal, who knows? I think it needs to be equitable. Figure out who has as many kids. And again, figure out what fields should be associated with that amount of kids. So we hear you, give us some time. Again, I didn't know that there were two clubs until Jeff, you and I were talking um, within the last couple of weeks. So thank you, we hear you, we will do what we can from here. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Councillor Muller. I make a motion to suspend the rules and move items A1 through A5, B1, B2, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Motion made to suspend Second. rules. Second. Seconded by Councilor Mangini. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing done by a show of hands. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstention? Nine in favor, zero, ten in favor, nine in favor, zero against, Sheila. I'll just be quick before we get the town, town manager report. Are we okay there? Yeah. So, no, so I just want to recognize, so leadership, in my opinion, comes in very different forms. And we're hearing a lot about young people tonight, and I want to recognize some young people who who, quite frankly, I think, you know, demonstrated leadership. Uh, myself, Councilor Hemler, Councilor Mother, Councilor Mangini were at the, uh, the, unfortunately we didn't have a parade, but we did have a ceremony. And, and it was indoors. So the Veterans Council, who does a fantastic job in this town, honoring their veterans, and obviously Memorial Day is a very solemn day, you know, reached out, because again, we miss hearing our bands play, whether it be JFK and Phil Heyer together. And I want to recognize these individuals who actually had the courage to show up, who, who my understanding didn't have any practice, and played fantastic. You know, I mean, made the whole ceremony that much more meaningful, and they did a great job. And these are kids. They they had, they volunteered. They weren't getting paid. Nothing. They just showed up, no practice, and played their instruments, and they made the entire ceremony that much better. And they got a standing ovation, as they should have. I just want to recognize Emily Van Vandal, who sang the national anthem and did a great job. And on the direction of, again, a fantastic band leader and teacher, Mark, and he's going to kill me because I'm going to ruin his name, Rapucci, um, the band director of Chris Dresco, and the assistant director of Aaron, again, he's going to kill me, Oversee. I, I'm sure I ruined his name. These, these fine young people, again, showed up, no practice, and played for our veterans. And you talk about leadership, that's leadership. Again, they did it because they were honoring people who gave, made a sacrifice for this town and this country. And that's what leadership is, in my opinion. So I want to honor these fine young people. And if I, if I ruin their names, I apologize to each of them in advance. Jackie Burrow, who played the fruit, flute. Sydney Omre, who played the fruit. Jonathan Laguerre, who played the flute. Aiden Payer, who played the flute. Robin Theolin, who played the flute. Jackson Bouchard, who was a clarinetist. Lindsay Tchaikovsky, clarinet. Harley Griffin, clarinet. Ariana Swanger, clarinet. Carter Boucher, Bouchard, excuse me, alto sax. Eric Serrard, alto sax. Josh Tetro, alto sax. Ledger Bartholomew, tenor sax. Aaron Coons, trumpet. Amber Holcomb, trumpet. Tyler Thibodeau, trumpet. Nate Messier, mellophone. Joseph Radowitz, trombone. Harrison Youngberg, trombone. Aaron Bemis, bartone. 
uh, Bartitone. Uh, Kanota Crawford, tuba. Aaron Justice, tuba. Jeremiah Agard, percussion. And Jacob Post, percussion. Again, if you, were, if you see a rerun of that, that show, they did a fantastic job. They did it with, because they honored our veterans. And again, that's, that's exactly how you, you, uh, you honor. When someone says you remember and you say, you know, your thoughts and prayers, well, it's your actions that matter. These kids, I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of the, the, the band director who had the courage to say, look, who wants to come out? Because I know, again, I know they were scrambling to get kids to even march in a parade. So again, this is an example of leadership in this town being demonstrated by young people. And everyone in this town should be proud of these, these fine young people. So I wanted to end on a high note. I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Town Manager Report, item nine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I would just like to elaborate a little bit. We did have the opening of the farmer's market uh, yesterday. Uh, we had reservations of almost 100 vendors, crafts, and vegetables, and food, pierogies. There's going to be pizza. So for all of you people who didn't know about it, please come. And there was an ice cream truck, so there's free ice cream. And we have free music uh, at the bandstand. So it's a nice event to come to. Uh, also, what we're going to do is collaborate with the 4th of July. They're going to be doing the parade on the 3rd. And probably we wouldn't have had the market on the 4th on Sunday of the 4th of July because vendors want to be home and people want to be home at their picnic. So we're going to work with them on the 3rd. So we're going to have the farmer's market on the 3rd. So it opens from 10 to 1. But the parade will be at 11. It'll uh culminate here at the town green so we have a lot of people i think we're also we're trying to plan a a um a proclamation by the council to those who really stepped up and offered the vaccination clinics to our residents in town uh, and all of the volunteers who staff that every day through the pandemic to make that available so we'd like to thank them so i think it would be a nice event we'll get more information out but please join us um in regard to, and the only reason I wouldn't put uh, Mark and Donald on the spot, but when I asked them to prepare their presentation, you know, my analysis, and I didn't know anything about the new soccer or the di the, the division of the uh, uh, leagues until recently, and I'm not going to disparage anybody. I don't think it's anybody's in anybody's best interest to do so. But I would like to thank the speakers for their civility and cordiality because it's important that we can talk about these issues and come forward, let the council know, and me know what's going on. Um, also, what are we doing with sports with our young kids? We want to teach them competition. We want to teach them respect. So to have parents come and, and act in the, with those three beautiful kids in the front, they should be impressed by what you said. And, and that's what government should be. And I, I commend you for it because we don't get anywhere yelling and screaming. And sometimes I've been here 32 years, and sometimes that's what it devolves into. And it's embarrassing for us, for our children, for people watching. So I thank you uh, for your respect to the process coming forward tonight. I really appreciate it. Now, having said that, when I did discover or learned of the, this, um, these competing interests, I asked Public Works, as I always do, what's the issue? So in preparation, I asked Mark and Donald last week to meet with the groups to try to see if there was some division. And my inquiry was really this, like I do with all issues. You know, how were the fields given out? The policy says first come, first serve. And I was assured that's how they were divvied out, so we're going to find out. Number two, were all the fields taken Monday through Saturday? Were there any available, particularly at Shaker? And I was informed that they, they've all been reserved. So I think it only fair I'm going to ask Mark and Don to come back just on those two issues. It's not an interrogation. It's not an inquisition. But I want to hear, so you all aren't waiting and the council isn't waiting and people at home, that that is the case. And having said that, if it is the case, it's what some of the council people said. Then it means we have finite fields. If they've been reserved under the policy, then we've got to amend the policy. The council's meeting Thursday at 2. There's not public uh, participation, but you could come and watch or listen, and, and we do have minutes, and we'll look towards a solution. They can amend it this year if they want. If we find that there are fields that are available, um, I hope that's not the case. I'll be very surprised. I, it would be nice if that's true, and then we could reallocate them under the existing policy. But if they've all been spoken for, then we're going to have to look to the council to say, well, you know what, we're going to intervene, look at percentages, look at something for this year to try to equitably uh, redistribute them. I, I will also say... Um, we did have a, a problem with the fields because I will let you know, we looked at the field policy. We, unlike a lot of other communities, weren't charging outside groups and for-profit groups to use our fields. And as you can see, they get pretty beat up. So we implemented a policy for nonprofit and for local teams, mostly the rosters would be Enfield kids, so that we knew, you know, Enfield taxpayers were paying and supporting Enfield families and uh, players. So we're going to look at that because I don't know that that's occurring. We've got to look at the policy 
policy. I think we really are going to have to look at the rosters because I'm not singling out soccer, but we're hearing in, in, in other uh, sports around that there's a lot of uh, for-profit, a lot of uh, players from out of town, and we just need to know that. We need to be equitable because if somebody really is for-profit, making a profit, it, it really would be like somebody coming forward, and we actually found this once, going to a school cafeteria saying, we're going to use your kitchen, we're going to use all of your uh, equipment, and we're going to do it on the weekends and at night, and we're going to charge people for the hamburgers. Well, we can't really subsidize uh, a for-profit. Um, we can charge a little bit, try to offset, and we looked at the policy to do that. But what I'd like you to know, this council, in addition to what I talked about earlier on the recreation uh, and the other amenities, I will tell you in this last budget, and we are looking for other sports fields for soccer now for the next budget season. So I want you to know this council is committed to sports in town. We put in... Um, three quarters of a million dollars for a new Brainerd Field softball because we're displacing the one behind Town Hall, so we replaced it. Um, we're upgrading Powder Hollow for men's baseball and, and for youth baseball from the high school. $750,000 they put in there. Um, they, al they also allocated $750,000 for a new turf field at the high school and a new track. So there has been a commitment by this council to sports. And now your voices are heard. And if you if there's a lot bigger need, well, we'll put in for more fields. Like I said, I already had a plan this evening. You'll hear more about to do just that. And in pretty large numbers for soccer in particular. Um, and we've been looking at that for months. It didn't just happen. So you can understand that we've been sort of looking at all the fields. Um, and lastly, I've been working with the superintendent of schools. We had hoped to be able to use some of the COVID money to get kids, just as one speaker eloquently picked, get kids back out of the house, off the computers and out, you know, playing sports and being outside to see if we could use some of the COVID money for fields. And at the high school, as you know, we have a real drainage issue, which is going to take about a half a million dollars to fix because we can't use the fields we have because they're flooded. And I've been working with the superintendent again before this to try to address that. So this council has had a commitment. We'll continue to do that moving forward. But again, I'd like to thank you for your civility and and, uh, your grace and coming up with your comments. And with that, I'm going to have Donald and um, Mark come up because I don't want anybody waiting. And just to address those two issues as to the fields um, that they were given out pursuant to the policy and that all of the fields are reserved. And I'm not going to scrutinize it beyond that. And then if council has a couple of questions, we'll let them go and we'll, we'll bring this up in great detail on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Welcome back, gentlemen. Do you need me on our names again? No? Yeah, yeah for the record, Donald, yes, Noon, should, Donald yeah. Noons, Director yeah. of Public Works. Mark R., Facilities Manager. Uh, Chris, if I can address one issue, one very, very quick issue. Uh, regarding the communication uh, between ESC and ESA, when I, when I uh, was working with Mr. With Mr. Ketchell during, you know, to decide what he had for fields available, I missed a line in the email where he requested confirmation that ESA accepted the two fields at Shaker. I did not respond back to Mr. Ketchell. That was 100% my fault. I missed it in email, and I take 100% responsibility for that. So going f going for that has been resolved, by the way. So uh, going forward, when we're talking about what fields were available, I, I reached out. I said, we had a, Mark and I had a long conversation with Mr. Ketchell. We had emails back and forth. I asked him for a schedule. He submitted me a schedule. and. I have to take his word for it that this is what he submitted. He submitted Monday through Friday what he had, what fields he was using, what people were there, and and whatever. So at that time, um, that's when we talked. I was speaking with Chris. That again, he he said that Mondays and Fridays was was not was available because they weren't using them at the time. So I asked Mr. Ketchell, as, as I'm sure the other coaches have, that if the coaches have their own executive freedom to like cancel a practice they could be running late they got a car accident or traffic and he said that their coaches can cancel on without uh, mr ketchell knowing which is a standard practice when my daughter um it, was, it wasn't through the club it was through again my daughter's coach they say well we're not gonna have practice tonight so some I, that's I, I don't know regarding how often it's used we're we we don't have the resources to be uh, field police, and we uh, we are going by Mr. Ketchell's and the ESC's word that this is their schedule. Like we get other schedules from um, Little League and all the other sports, we get schedules for them because we have to prep those fields for either a game or practice or the like. So we we are just prepping them, and we're doing that based upon what is submitted to us. What they do outside of that, 
I have no control over, nor does Mark, nor does anyone here, if they want to, if they have to cancel or need to cancel. I don't, I can't control that. Um, so regarding, I just a quick thing about conditions, the, the, the two things between Hale and Twain and EHS Annex and Shaker is irrigation. We don't have irrigation on, on Twain or Hale. Without water, it doesn't mean anything. We can fertilize all day long. It's not going to, nothing's going to grow because we don't have water. So with a, a, this may be a, a different view for council, whether it's more CIP projects, whether it's investment in other things or larger facilities, this all has to be part of a grander plan because, with, again, without water, no matter where we put it, whether it's the baseball teams that are there, the Little League teams that are at Twain, it doesn't matter. We're in, there's, we cannot grow the grass without that. So that's that's my or well i appreciate it. and i don't want to belabor it anymore with no. them i understand now that they're basing it upon representation so we'll dig a little deeper and find out the actual use of these fields i knew you would i didn't have any compunction calling you up because you you men have always been honorable and you've never misled me ever so i knew i could call you up cold uh, not without any rehearsal and, and answer these folks but we're going to look into it deeper to see if there is availability currently at the fields and if there is we will share it equitably so with that I thank everybody on this issue. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Any questions for the town manager? The only thing I'll make a comment to you is, again at the uh, the town green in a couple. Of, we, we got to meet a lot of the vendors, and a lot of them are from outside of Enfield, which is very interesting. And a very nice lady came all the way from Bridge oh, came all the way from Bridgeport, and, uh, and I was just chatting with her, and I said, "Well, that's a long ride to get here in the morning." She said, "You know, people in Enfield are nice." So, I mean, you know, I've heard that I, 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 vendors, great. I, I have to tell you, we had a waiting list because, you know, we were turning people away with the with the distancing. And this year, it's nice to have that kind of competition. But last year, we were sort of beating the bushes to get people. And I actually reached out and talked to vendors and they told me the same thing. They'd never met nicer people than they had in Enfield. So it, it's people, wonderful. If, even if you don't want to shop, I mean, there's music. Take your chair, sit in the town green and relax. Enjoy the beautiful green and relax. Well, get an ice cream and listen yeah. to some music. I All mean, right. if, you're, if you're bored, come on down. And then, like I say, we're going to have a lot more amenities by next summer. All right, we move on to uh, town item 10, town attorney report. Yeah, given the uh, hour, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to cede my time. There's no town attorney report tonight. Thank you, sir. We move on to item 11, report any special committees. Seeing. I do, Jeff Case, going along really quick. I just want to give a quick update. They'll be taking over Red House June 17th. So that's kind of the last, one of the last ones. And August 2022 is coming really quick. And I did ask the chairman to reach out to the town attorney and, and the manager's office to, the manager's office to get a presentation okay. as soon as we could. Thank right. you. Future presentation to JFK. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yes. Item 12, old business. Uh, item A remains on the table. 13, item new business. Item A, consent agenda. There is none. Item B, appointments town council appointed. There are none. Item C, appointments town manager. There is none. Item D, P and Z commission appointed, council approved. There are none. Item 14, under consent agenda. Item A, 1 through 5, has been moved to miscellaneous. 6 is, uh, again, miscellaneous, but not part of the consent agenda. Sorry, let me get that. Where is it? Mm -mm 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 -mm, right here. Sorry about that. And then we move on to item B, town council appointed. Items one and two been moved to miscellaneous. Item C, appointments, town manager appointed, council approved, there are none. Item D, appointments, PNZ commission appointed, council approved, there are none. Item E, discussion, resolution, uh, excuse me, E, F, G, H, I, J, K and L have all been moved to miscellaneous. We move on to miscellaneous. Make sure I'm, I have multiple papers here. We move on to miscellaneous. Okay. Item items A one discussion resolution request transfer funds for Family Resource Center a thousand dollars. Item A two request for transfer funds for information and technology for public safety one hundred fifty thousand. Item three discussion resolution authorizing the town manager to make and sign an application and execute assistance assistance agreement with the state of Connecticut Department of Housing for twenty twenty one community development block grant. Item four discussion resolution authorizing the Board of Education to apply to state of Connecticut Department of Homeland Security for round five of the school security competitive grant. 
a program. Item five, discussion resolution authorizing the Board of Education to apply to State of Connecticut Department of Homeland Security and multimedia inter interoperable um, communication system school security grant are all on the um, consent agenda. Uh, any discussion? We lost TV. Um, Sheila, roll call, please. It's on, I'm behind you. Oh, Sheila, roll call, please. Is the consent? Oh, sorry, there's no roll call. Anyone, no uh, discussions? I'm losing my head here. All in favor? Right. Opposed? Yeah. Abstention? Eight in favor, zero against, Sheila. Sorry about that. Okay, we move on to B1. So let me just get there. Apologize. Make sure all these papers. Okay, one second. All right. Okay, B1. Um, Enfield Culture Arts Committee, we have the Office of uh, a Reappointment of Emily Clifford. It is expired. Do I have a nomination, please? I'd like to nominate Air, um, Emily Clifford. Nomination made. Second. Second. Seconded by Councillor Riley. Is there a motion to close nominations? So moved. By Councillor Muller. Seconded by Councillor Speraza. All those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Opposed abstention. Eight in favor, Sheila. Zero against the closing nomination. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please, Sheila. Councilor Bosco. Bosco. He, he's here. Bosco. Uh, appointment of Emily Clifford. Four. He said four. Four. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hamler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Emily Clifford. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Sakrasa. Four. Councilor Undyer. Four. It's nine, nine in favor, favor none against. against. Thank you, no Sheila. Distance. Thank you, Sheila. Item B2, Inland Wetlands um, Water Course Agency. The uh, a term of Virginia Higley is expired. This is would be a reappointment. Do I have a nomination, please? Yes. Councilor Mangini. I'd like to reappoint Virginia Higley. Motion made. Second by Councilor Mother. Is there a motion to close nominations? Motion. By Councilor Sakala. Second by uh, Councilor Sparazza. All those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Uh, Sheila, nine, eight, nine in favor, zero against the closing nomination. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing on roll call, please, Sheila. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Ginny Higley. Councilor Hemler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Virginia Higley. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Sofraza. Four. Councilor Ungar. Four. It's, it's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Thank you, Sheila. Item E under miscellaneous discussion resolution request for transfer of funds for neighborhood services professional development of 25000 Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section AF of the Town Charter, the following transfers hereby made. Two neighborhood services, other professional services of $25,000 from uh, the neighbor, neighborhood services salaries um, line item of 25000 certified that the above funds are available as of June 7, 2021, by John Wilcox, the Director of Finance, and approved by our Town Manager, Chris Bromson. So moved. By Councilor Muller. Second. Second by Councilor Riley. I'm not, I'm going to have Cindy stay. I, I, I would have uh, waived her attendance tonight, but if there's any questions, but given the hour, this is important. We haven't had a strategic plan since 2012, so she very um, proactively has come up with uh, money within her budget in professional development to fund 25000 for a consultant to work with the new grants manager and give us a strategic plan going forward. So I uh, endorse it. I, again, thank her for her uh, forward thinking. That's why we hired her. She has not let us down since she's been here. Top to bottom review on everything she's doing, and this is another example of it. And if you do have questions, I don't want to preclude her, but I think it's uh, simple and self-explanatory. Any questions? Cindy, you're off the hook. Thank you. <laughs> Roll call, please, Sheila. Councilor Bosco. Bosco. Four. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hamler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Sparazza. Four. Councilor Ungar. Four. 
That's nine, nine in favor, none, none against, against, and no abstentions. abstentions. Thank you, Sheila. Item F under miscellaneous discussion resolution request for transfer of funds for police department, $523,480. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter to fall on transfers hereby made. Two police services salaries, overtime, health, medical insurance, and Medicare of $523,480 from the general fund appro appropriated fund balance of $523,480. Certified that the above funds are available as of June 2nd, 2021 by our Director of Finance, John Wilcox, and approved by our Town Manager, Chris Bromson. So moved. By Councillor Moe. Second. Seconded by Councillor Mangini. You know, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, you all know the significance of this um, because I'm going to be brief doesn't belie the importance of what right. you're about to vote on. This is a crucial and vital uh, resolution. Um, and we've talked this evening about quality of life. You know, everything we do in town, I remember working with the chief as director of public safety, comes down to the first tenet of government, which is to keep our citizens safe. Because short of that, nothing else matters. Our education, our, our bike trails, uh, anything else we do. And this council has always been a firm uh, supporter of our police, but in a very uh, attentive, in a very uh, scrupulous way. In other words, they, they really look at the proposals that come forward and assess them on their merits. And you all always have done that um, while supporting public safety, but also the the fiscal reality of our situation. Uh, I will be brief. We have recently, within the last couple of weeks, at the council's direction and part of our building consolidation plan, um, we moved a substation <laughs> into the Enfield Express, 800 Enfield Street. And the reasoning was we wanted a presence downtown here, but also into Thompsonville. And we didn't do it so that an officer would sit there and uh, you know not go out into the community. We specifically, in the chief, wrote the order that we have our bike patrol there, our community policing patrol that we fund separately during the summer to go into Thompsonville, but we realized that what we really needed was committed resources, a constant presence in the substation day and night to address Thompsonville and to make sure we had officers going there and actually meeting the businesses and the, the residents and becoming part of the fabric. You can't do that if you rotate officers through. So you appropriated last time money so we could start doing four-hour shifts, which I will tell you, they did just what they promised. They've been going into the community. I've had calls back from businesses so impressed the officers came to introduce themselves, but the next day it's someone else. So this resident officer program will allow us by hiring four officers to staff. We're going to specifically staff, just like we do the school resource officers. Those are hand-picked officers that want to be in the schools with our children, and that's their assignment, and that's all that they do. Likewise now, by hiring four, that will enable us to have one during the day and one during the evening assigned there. The chief is going to scrupulously adhere to the council's uh, desire that they embed themselves in the fabric of Thompsonville and this area, in addition to the other patrols and resources, to try to make sure we have a, a good police presence and address the issues that are different to a little bit of a more urban area of Thompsonville than a more rural area in town. So I commend the council. They asked the chief to look at this. He's come forward with this very cohesive plan, and it's a commitment. Um, and I, I strongly endorse it, but I know you're going to be supportive because you asked for us to uh, come up with a plan of this sort. Number two, there's one additional office to round it off at five. That will go from 95 sworn officers in the Info Police Department to 100. It's a commitment of a half a million dollars a year by this council to public safety. And that one office there is a promise we made. Uh, the Joint Security Committee of the Council and the Board of Ed meet. It's a very active group. They assess security uh, on a quarterly basis. One of the things we identified, given the size of the JFK school was, we needed another committed SRO there. Um, and we wanted to have it in the fall when the school reopens uh, to assure security of, uh, of our students. So. We came up with that. The council, it's for your consideration to have that fifth person. The committee, the subcommittee of the council, and the uh, board members all endorse it. And I will tell you, this is in addition to the commitment this council has made. We call it the Enhanced School uh, Security Officer Program, or the SRO program, that we have on a daily basis. And, you know, we don't talk about it much because security, you really shouldn't. I've said it before, you don't give your alarm code out on TV or Facebook. But we have officers 
teachers in all of our elementary schools every day. They rotate through in our Catholic schools, in addition to those committed on a daily basis to the high school and to the middle school. So this is an addition and another uh, commitment to the security of our students going forward. So I commend it to you. The chief was unavailable this evening, but we have had discussions about this under security, uh, and he has made very um, eloquent presentations. So I urge that you pass it this evening. Any questions from any counselor? No, and I, and I think to the SRO, I mean, Councillor Mangini is part of the, uh, the committee, Councillor Sferraza. Again, keeping our promise to the Board of Education that we were going to do this, and um, it's important. I mean, I, and then listening to the, the recommendation from the chief, and uh, so again, this council deserves a lot of credit for acting quickly, too, by the way, proactively. I mean, we're trying to get that officer before that building is fully open. I mean, not waiting till after, and then we have an issue. I mean, it's we're being proactive again as we try to be in a lot of these things. So well done by the town council on this. Sheila, roll call, please. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hemler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Sufraza. Four. Nice. Councilor Ungayer. Four. That's hey. nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Good stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Great stuff. We move on to item G, request uh, discussion resolution, request for bid waiver for the purchase of installation of a splash pad at Edgar Parkins, Parkman School. It's going to be open tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, whereas the council has determined that it is in the interest of the town that a splash pad be installed at Edgar H. Parkman School and, thus, and, and that such splash pad be open for use during the summer of 2021. Whereas conducting a competitive bidding process would add significant delays to the project, which would delay opening it until the summer of 22. Now, therefore, be it resolved in the accordance with Chapter 5, Section 8, Paragraph D of the Enfield Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby determine that it is against the best interest of the town to require competitive bidding for the construction uh, for the construction of a splash pad at the Parkman School, submitted on May 20th, 21, by the Department of Public Works. So moved. By Second. Councilor uh, Mangini, seconded by Councilor Mahler. Pretty straightforward. I mean, we were even a bid because we want this done so the kids can have something to look forward to this summer. Correct. If we hadn't given the okay to purchase it, and again, this right. was in the budget and it was funded, um, but we had to change vendors and it was a $10,000 increase. All costs have gone up, um, so it was $110,000 total. I thank Donald and I, I thank John Wilcox for acting upon this so we could order it and hopefully get it in by the end of July, early August. If we had not, we would have missed out on this season. So the town attorney weighed in. We got a consensus of council that we should proceed and that we would retroactively approve it tonight. And that's what we're asking of you. It's great news. Any questions? I mean, hopefully we will be having a grand opening of epic proportions on Parkman School. Hearing none, roll call, please, Sheila. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hamler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Definitely four. Councilor Sopraza. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Four. That's nine in favor, none against, and no abstention. Thank you, Sheila. Item H under miscellaneous discussion resolution, a resolution to establish, establish a special revenue fund for COVID-19. Whereas the town of Enfield has received or will receive funding from various programs to provide relief for the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas many of these programs require reporting on the use of these funds. And whereas the town of Enfield wishes to create a special revenue fund for the pur purpose of accounting for all funds received for COVID-19 relief. And whereas the special revenue fund will accumulate the pandemic relief funds and will allow expenditures of such funds as permitted pursuant to such programs. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Enfield Town Council does hereby establish the COVID-19 Special Revenue Fund, effective immediately, submitted on May 11, 2020, by our Greg Simmons, Treasurer and Deputy Director of Finance. So moved. By Councillor Muller. Second by Councillor Riley. 
quite simply, uh, we are going to be the recipient of federal money under the COVID relief, the CARES, and also the American Rescue Plan. John is recommending we put this clearly in an, a separate fund so we know where the money is, how much is there, and then we're still going to seminars and learning from the state and the federal government as to how we're going to be able to spend it. We know it'll be in the millions of dollars, but it's very it's going to be highly regulated. We may have to make application uh, for particular projects under the program to the state. We're just not quite sure, but this keeps it very transparent. So when the money comes in and future money comes in, it'll be segregated. We'll know how much is there, and then we'll be able to counsel, counsel on how we're able to spend it and come forward with those projects that are um, uh, approved and get consensus to go forward with them. And that's it. Any questions for the town manager? And we, Chris, we haven't received any federal money just yet, right? Uh, not. That's correct. Correct, right? right. Supposed to be imminent. Well, again, I, the checks in the mail. Again, yeah. Mr. O'Reilly. <laughs> way to be. Well, the government tells you the checks in the mail, or they're here to help you. Way to be proactive, though. I mean, we have our own special fund, and we're going to, you know, be able to. People can track how we're spending that money. So correct. It's going to be very to transparent fund, as right, to how. Exactly. This is a great idea, John. Yeah. Making finance special again, John. <laughs> Roll call, call, please. He's a rock star. He really is. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Hamler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Miller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Sifraza. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. <clears throat> That's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Making Sheila earn her money tonight. Moving on to item I, resolution to appoint members of the Tax Incentive Financing Advisory District Committee. Whereas on April 5th, 2021, the Enfield Town Council modified the advisory committee membership provisions of the Tax Incentive Financing Policy, also known as TIF, Town Council Resolution Number 5739. Now, therefore, be it resolved that in accordance with the resolution number 5, 739, the Enfield Town Council hereby appoints the following individuals to the TIF Advisory Committee. Councillor Kelly Hemler, Councillor Cindy Mangini, Richard Stroney from the Economic Development Commission, William Cote from the Conservation Commission, and Francis Alima from the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, submitted on April 8, 2021 by Lori Witten, our Director of Development Services. So moved. By Councillor Muller. Second. Second by Councillor Riley. Fairly straightforward. It's, yeah, yeah, it's quite simple. We need to have yeah. these folks in place so that they can assess how to spend the funds from TIF and make recommendations to the council going forward. Uh, any questions? Roll call, please, Sheila. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hemler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councillor Sapraza. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. That's nine in favor, nine against, and no abstentions. Thank you, Sheila. Mo item J, discussion resolution, resolution to withdraw to, to, to withdraw the CDBG shelter diversion application submitted to the Connecticut Department of Housing. Resolved that the town manager or his designee is authorized to withdraw the application by, made by the town of Enfield Department of Social Services on May 22nd, 2020, 2020 excuse me, for the shelter diversion program prepared by Cindy Guerrero, Director of Social Services on June 7th, 2021. So moved. By Councillor Muller. Second. Second by Councillor Riley. Uh, uh, Cindy is here. We need her for this. Uh, she and Kasha and John Wilcox have worked on this issue. They have grappled with it, uh, but unfortunately they have a recommendation to make, which they'd rather not. But for the reasons Cindy will set forth, it's in the best interest of the town at this juncture, I think, to terminate the program in, in its present form. And she's going to fill you in as to her thinking. Welcome, Cindy. Just name and uh, title, and you have the floor. Thank you. Cindy Guerrero, Director of Social Services, Town of Enfield. Um, I think the biggest thing to understand about this program, the program that was originally funded ended in December of 2020, and we have been waiting to hear from the state on our application that was made last May. Um, in the interim, we continue to serve anyone that comes through our doors, is referred to us, and or out walking in the woods, along the river, talking with people in, in, in encampments and offering them assistance and service. So nothing has changed as far as that service delivery, and it will not change. What does change is that 
we don't have the responsibility to serve outside of Enfield and some of our close by relatives. Um, a lot of time in the original grant was spent it, with the Greater Hartford CAN network, the uh, Coordinated Access Network. And so it really took away time to be able to serve Enfield folks. Um, the other part of that grant was largely, um, it was provided to a nonprofit organization for direct service, so we're not losing the direct service, we are losing the responsibility to administer the grant. So it's actually a win-win for us that we can focus more on the needs that are being presented. Last week we had two, RPD, we work really well with them. I love the description. The, we're really working one together with them one-on-one -on -one as part of the fabric of Thompsonville. And that's really we want, where we want to be concentrating our time and effort. So to be waiting around for a year on the state to make a decision um, is not really how we want to conduct our business. We want to keep moving forward. Fair enough. Any questions for Cindy? All I can say is I've been personally involved in someone you you helped, your staff helped, and I mean, fantastic work. I, I, I know I'm, I, I can't remember her name, but the, the social worker did a great job. And you remember the reaction from that individual. Yes. A veteran that you folks kept off the streets. Right. And yeah. housed. Exactly. And, and your, remain, staff, uh, your staff did it. Right. And your staff is, again, fantastic. Yeah. And Mr. Mayor, members of the council, again, this is what Cindy had promised to do, to come in and review top to bottom mm -hmm. and to recommend to continue with those things that are working and to review and discontinue those things that are not or that we can do in a better manner. So I commend her for that. She's been very thoughtful. Her cover memo and her, uh, you know, thinking with you and working with Kosh and John uh, is commendable. So I, I recommend this wholeheartedly and thank her for her efforts. Great. And thank you for hanging in there. I know it's been a late night. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> Roll call, please, Sheila. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hemler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Surprise. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Four. That's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Thank you, Cindy. Item, thank you, Sheila, and thank you, Cindy. Item K, discussion resolution. Resolution authorizing the town to utilize funds from revenue from for the town-wide community gardens locations. Whereas the town, Enfield Town Council previously authorized the creation of the revenue account for the Townsville Community Garden, which allows residents and businesses to submit plot fees and donations. Whereas the town has recently expanded its community garden locations, and whereas the town currently purchases tools, materials, and equipment for the Townsville Community Garden location from revenue account 23406116. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council authorizes any community garden revenues received by the town can be committed to the purchase of tools, materials, and equipment to be used at, any, at all the town-wide community garden locations and may be paid from account 23406116, submitted by Nelson Tereso, our Dir Deputy Director of Economic Development, on May 25th, 2021. So moved. By Councilor Muller. Second. Seconded by Councilor Riley. I will, I will just say that, as uh, you all know, the council um, put in a lot of uh, additional funding to have additional gardens and expand the program. Um, Kosh is going to address um, where we're at. We have uh, uh, really, it's been a remarkable year again. There have been some, uh, a few, we've changed consultants and there have been a few growing pains. Do you get how I put that in there? Gardens, growing pains, Mr. Mayor. And... Um, I laughed. I, I laughed. I mean, it's at the end. We're almost there, folks. Just set a public hearing and you're out the door. Um, but Kasha, if you could give a little overview in on this specifically, I'd appreciate Kasha and, and the new. They've done a wonderful job of shepherding this. It's really exciting for our community. Again, with all of the different places you can do community gardening in the in the town. Again, I thank kudos to the council for having the vision to expand this program and give our residents a chance to get out there, get their hands dirty in the earth. Kasha. Welcome, Kasha. Just name and title, you have the floor. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Kasha for Cielo, Assistant Town Manager. Um, so oh, this, this year, year we're up to 210, 210 community gardens. Um, as Chris said, we do have a new consultant on board as well. I've been meeting with him, uh, Lori, and Nelson, and myself, and Cheryl, uh, who are overseeing, uh, we're all overseeing the program. 
Um, right now, we have four gardens that are completely full, uh, Chapel Street, Thompsonville, Alcorn, and the library. Those are completely full. We are still working on Green Manor and Lafayette. Those are two of the new gardens. Um, we are, of course, you know, with this year, everything is delayed. So still working on getting some fencing and sheds. And so they're not fully done yet, but they are very, very close. And we're working as quickly as possible with the material shortage this year. Um, the purpose of this resolution specifically, uh, we did, um, if you remember last year, we crowdfunded for the gardens. We did the same thing this year. Uh, we raised $12,000 uh, to redo the walking path around the Green Manor Community Garden uh, to go through the garden into the neighborhood behind the garden. Um, when uh, the campaign ended, we realized that the fund to accept those uh, those funds is actually just uh, dedicated to the Thompsonville Community Garden because it was done before our expansion. So this uh, resolution allows us uh, to make the fund uh, for all the community gardens that we have in town, not just one specific one. So this way we'll be able to receive the funds and uh, we've already worked with Donald and Jeffrey at DPW begin construction of the path um, as quickly as possible as soon as you know we have materials um, and are able to do so. Um, and with that, um, I can take any questions anyone may have. And the gardens, uh, just so the public is aware, uh, there is no closing date for when you can reserve a garden. So if anyone is listening to this tonight and is interested in uh, having a garden in Green Manor or Lafayette, please reach out to uh, Development Services, check our website, and we'd be more than happy to accommodate. Thank you, Kasha. Any questions for Kasha? Hearing none, this is good news. Um, roll call, please. Sheila? Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hemler. Four. Four. Councilor Hemler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Four. Councilor Surprise. Four. Four. Councilor Ungar. Four. 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 It's nine, nine in favor, none against, against and no abstention. abstention. Thank you, Sheila. Item L, discussion resolution, resolution setting public hearing for the 21 Neighborhood Assistance Act. Whereas the town council of the town of Enfield values the opinion and comments of its constituents, whereas any elector or taxpayer may have an opportunity to be heard regarding the 21 2021 Neighborhood Assistant Act proposals and now therefore be resolved, the Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town Hall, Enfield Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Monday, May, uh, June 21st, 2021 at 6.50 p.m. to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinion regarding the 2021 Neighborhood Assistant Act submitted by the Town Manager's Office on May 24th, 2021. So moved. By Councilor Muller. Second. By Councilor Mangini. Uh, very straightforward. Any questions? Roll call, please, Sheila. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hemler. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Spraza. Four. Councilor Ungar. Four. It's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Thank you, Sheila. Is the individual still here? They were sitting. No, he left. He left. So item si eight, 16, public communications. Uh, we have none. Item 17, any councilor communications? One. Councilor Ungar. Sorry, I know we all, all want to get going. Um, we all have this uh, in front of us. The Commission on Aging just printed these up, and it has all important phone numbers for all our seniors, and they'll be available at numerous places in town. Okay. Anyone else? Here on, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. By Councilor Muller. Second by Councilor Riley. All those in favor, say, show of hands. Nine in favor, zero against. Good night, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.